Welcome back to the Pod of Greed. It's right, another week, another um, chance to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! and stuff. You might notice if you're watching the video of this that uh, we're recording this a little bit later in the day. How would they notice? How could they tell? Well, the lighting's a little bit different. I never see the lighting in videos. I'm very receptive to those things. They might not be. However, um, it's because we wanted to watch the PlayStation State of Play that was actually happening Mm -hmm. today. And then cover some of our thoughts on the games here in the podcast. So we'll get into there that weren't a that bit later. many. Who would have thought? Yeah, we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so first of all, I do have a review for us as always. Uh, this one comes from Apple Podcasts, and we got a one star review. Uh, this person says, uh, "This is from Try PA." I'm disappointed with how your podcast is so good. I can't watch other people's <laughs> content anymore. <laughs> I did one star because I wanted your attention, but you're five stars in my heart. You guys are awesome, and the only Yu-Gi-Oh content I can stand to watch. It's kind of a little scary to hear. That's I appreciate solid. how I can tell you guys just love the game and don't feel the need to scream and yell just to try and be interesting. Your knowledge and enthusiasm for Yu-Gi-Oh and card games in general bleed through into your content, and I imagine making these videos is easy as pie. I remember seeing you guys when I was collecting when I was a lot younger, but since I learned how to actually play the game this last year, I'm now able to truly appreciate it. Keep it up, fellas. That was Thank a great you. appreciate review. it. Even if you didn't have to actually leave the one star, but you know. What do you mean? A one star review with a great write up is better than any five star review. Everyone, leave more one star. <laughs> okay, no, don't. Maybe, do maybe don't. don't. Do um, <laughs> but you know, no, I do. We do appreciate it. Um, it's fun. It's cool that someone who only learned how to play within the past year is uh, engaging in the content. I think that's reassuring to hear. It shows that uh, that you know we're not completely over the hill yet. <laughs> that too. So um, thank you for the review. Of course, if you guys are watching on YouTube, you can you know give a thumbs up. But if you're listening on any podcast platform of choice, feel free to leave a five-star review. It certainly helps. It sure does. And we'll try to read out more and more of those on the podcast. Also, shout out to anybody watching the YouTube premiere right now. Ones in chat. Y'all the real ones. Yeah, we'll try to be in chat uh, watching as well. Okay, I think without further ado, we can finally get into the Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, always the top thing on our subject list is Yu-Gi-Oh. And um, there's a few things, right? Yeah, there's some stuff going on. So um, I don't know. I don't remember exactly how much of this we covered last week. But Phantom Nightmare is actually formally releasing Mm -hmm. um, next week. And so this weekend is going to be the sneak peek events. And we actually got one at our local scene. Yeah, our local uh, card shop, A&H Games, you want to look it up, um, is actually having a sneak peek for Phantom Nightmare. This is kind of a pleasant bit of news for us because our area does not always get to have sneak peeks so nor does it really have you give consistent consistently at all yeah so that's kind of uh, a bit of a bit of an issue but yeah so they're gonna be having that it's pretty exciting i think the last time that i was able to attend a sneak peek was the cyberstorm access sneak peek last year that mm-hmm. was in like may or so um now that was a lot of fun yeah so we went with uh one of our friends, Pheromone, mm-hmm. who actually did a video with us recently, too. Flame Swordsman versus Gaia the Dragon Champion. I remember that was a sneak peek where I lost every single round, but I won two drawings. Yeah, uh, you were very lucky. I, I don't think I won anything. I got a mat and a card. I played in a tournament and didn't do all that well. All I had to do was lose. But, um, yeah, so that's going to be happening. It's going to be pretty cool. That also just reminds me that there is... We pretty much have like the final, you know, rarities and everything mm-hmm. for Phantom Nightmare. Um, seems like it's going to be an exciting but less expensive set. Than yeah, it Age does of seem like Konami's taking it a little bit easier on us. Uh, a lot, the, a lot of the cards that we were most looking forward to, well, us like sinful spoil players, uh, they actually didn't get secret rare treatment for once. So. Yeah, Yay. that's pretty cool. Um, I was actually going to pull up this rarity list, but something I hadn't seen is some of the TCG exclusive like import stuff. Have you? Oh yeah, they um th- those got they got revealed by YouTubers, and I don't know if I have them all, but I want to draw attention to a uh, psychic processor. It, it's a uh, level three effect monster. Mm-hmm. It actually can um you can banish the special summon up to two, so that sets up extra deck shenanigans. Machines, psychics, and or cybers monsters from your hand, and they can attach. They can attack directly this turn. I'm not 100 percent sure um, why you'd want to attack directly, but it is cool to lie, to kind of have machine psychic cyber support when those three types all feel kind of similar. Yeah, they all feel like they're in the same same vein. Um, and then there's up. Oh, I click something and it went away. Oh, there we go. There was also Psychic Arsenal, which I feel like is in the same vein here. I think a lot of the Psychic cards that I saw that are like uh, imports or whatever 
have um or not imports i guess they're like new cards or whatever mm-hmm. but like they have the life point paying effects yeah this one uh, you pay life points equal to one of your psychic monsters level and you add a machine monster so yeah so these are all these are all really cool because it kind of harkens back to the early psychic days if you remember when the psychic type was first introduced into Yu-Gi-Oh, mm-hmm. and um they all like paid life points that was their sort yeah. of defining gimmick so and then there's also emergency a port or Apport, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just a um, special summons a banished psychic. So. Yeah. Is it a quick play spell? Trap. Oh, it's a trap. So it's like, it's like an emergency teleport, um, sort of like, I don't call it a retrain. I don't know what the word would be. Yeah, it's kind of, more, it's more so like, it's a reference to. Like, yeah. I wouldn't call it a retrain. I guess you could play it in a pure psychic deck. I always hate when they make those sorts of tra- things like trap cards, though, because it's like, it makes, it just it's a, probably it, just a little too slow. It's worse down. You know, across the board. But, you know, maybe there's a use for it. There was also a convertible. Like, like convertible was a convertible. Mm-hmm. It's a winged beast flip effect monster. Mm-hmm. And uh, this guy was interesting. It um, You can special summon a level 5 or higher flip monster from your deck in face down defense position. Except itself. And then during the battle phase, if this card is in your hand, quick effect. You can target one face down monster on the field and send it to the graveyard. And if you do, special summon this card into face down defense position. Okay, yeah, you know I've actually noticed with a lot of those like little import cards, they like to make them like weird pendulums, or they'll do like flip effects or whatever. Very specific flip effects. Though this thing can help any deck that runs flips. Okay, there aren't many, but wow. you know. <laughs> okay, you guys gonna be a hater. Now, I bet you're gonna hate them next card too, aren't you? Okay. Swarm of centipedes. Oh, is that like a swarm of locusts and like sort of no. sort of swarm of whatever type of card? It is. Oh, wait. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, so I mean, it's called swarm At first, of- I didn't see the, the flip effect thing. Then I remembered, wait, they don't have that. And yeah, What does it do? So when it's flipped, you can target one other monster on the field, change it to face up attack position or face down defense position, and then you can only use this effect once per turn. That's cool. So I it's also- a flipper. I'd also noticed that we got um, all the rarities are confirmed. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to quickly kind of go over them, or not really in specific detail, but none of the secret rare cards really seem to be high demand things. There's um, like Vados, that's that like Ashen thing. Um, oh, okay. I was but, like, Ooh. yeah, well, it doesn't have Ashen in the name. It's yeah. Vados, the eruption dragon of extinction. But like Lo, the voiceless, the goblin bikers, that Magispector card, um, Horus, the black flame itself. And the Black Goat Laughs. Those are like secret rare cards. And I think that it's hmm. kind of... Yeah, it's kind of interesting because most of the high demand stuff is actually ultra rare. That's like your... um, Obviously, you know, there's like Promethean Princess. But also right. um, Poplar, Snake Eye Poplar. And Ubel, the Loving Defender. I thought Ubel was going to get like a secret rare I thought it was slot. too. That's disrespectful. Sephira, Voiceless, and Skull Guardian, Voiceless. Those are both like ultras. Mm-hmm. Some more Goblin Biker stuff. So it's a set that I think compared to Age of Overlord will probably be more affordable. I think so. But now my question is, should a person prefer to buy buy a secret stacked box like Age of Overlord or an ultra stacked box like Phantom Nightmare? Yeah, that's a good question. What do you think? Because in a box, you get two secrets, right? Yeah, on average, two secrets, four ultras. And then you get four ultras. If... If a box has multiple secrets that are desirable, and you, but you only get two, like yeah, might that, it be better if the ultras are like generally more desirable cards? Because you're going to pull double the amount of ultras. A tricky question because um, some people would prefer that boxes have high val- like a lot of high value secrets versus a lot of high value ultras. Don't know where I land on it, but I think. This sort of a box is probably a little bit more desirable for people who like to buy singles. Mm-hmm. And I think a little bit less desirable for people who like to buy sealed product. Since, like, well, it depends on your what you're buying sealed product for, I guess. But if you're buying sealed product in the hopes that it will, like, make your money back, then I would probably much sooner buy a box of Age of Overlord than this. But it's also still right. assuming that you can get it at the, like, general MSRP of, like, you know, 70 bucks or so. Which is not always the case. Which isn't always the case. And, like, right now, Age of Overlord, I know, like, a box of it's, like, $120, $140 or something like that. High value. Sale. So this, Phantom Nightmare, I guess you could probably have gotten for, like, $60, $70 if you've done pre-orders. But then, like, it still wouldn't... Like, I don't see any of these secret rare cards really I mean, costing loads and loads of money. Maybe low voiceless 
And that's we'll on one price. of the few that I think you necessarily need three of. And I think some it, Goblin Biker's got two secrets, so I know you'll probably want three of those. But you know, as far as in demand secrets, you can kind of get away with one. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. I wonder um, if I mean I don't think I'm sure this was decided like several months back. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting to see that like maybe Konami thought this would be a better way to distribute the rarities compared to Age of Overlord, since Age of Overlord was so much more. Uh, controversial because of all those secret rares this i think will be at least less controversial it will be nice that uh because you know i I like to play sinful spoils Mm -hmm. or at least i want to the uh the singles are actually going to be like fairly affordable just because because they're ultra there'll be more on the market Mm -hmm. so for once uh i won't have to spend a hundred per copy yeah, I've actually decided that I'm going to try to build the voiceless deck. And mm. yeah, I don't, I mean, I was looking through the set and I really was not seeing a lot of stuff that I was super interested in building, to be like completely you honest. You don't want to build Goblin Bikers? Nah, um, the Goblin Biker thing didn't really stick out to me as all that interesting. And I have found that I've been liking more of these um, non-extra deck based strategies or like mm-hmm. largely main deck kind of focused strategies. And so I thought that was kind of cool. Like, I've been enjoying Rescue Ace. I've been enjoying Bank with Soul. And so I'm finding that, like, more than anything, I just want to play decks where, like, I'm um, doing things, like, kind of within the archetype, within the main deck. I don't want to just, like, summon a a Dispater or a Barone or whatever at the end of my combo. I kind of just want to, like, see what does this deck have to offer. So Right. That's why you played Labyrinth. Yeah, because actually. you like setting traps. That too. I mean, but it's true though. Like, I really do like decks that don't um, just, you know, spam out the same extra deck stuff. I made a video about that actually recently on... I don't like playing combo decks, so I, I never really get to make those uh, extra, those generic extra deck monsters. Would you believe me if I said, I don't think I've ever, like, synchro summoned a Barone in my life. I could believe you, because I haven't. Yeah, like, I don't think... I mean, it's like, it's not for lack that. of, like, owning it. It's like, just, like... I do not like decks that summon it because most decks that summon it, it's not like... Like, the only time I'd want to summon a Barone, and this is going to sound very, you know, Yugi Boomer of me, is, like, if I was playing a Fleur deck. I, you know, I was working on one of those. Yeah, I remember I you wanted to build every it. card, then I couldn't get a Barone, and I was like, you know what, screw yeah, this. Expensive. But um, I have a Barone now, and... Yeah. Uh, Thanks for the question. Day. Everybody does. I, oh, I had one before then, too. Yeah. I don't want to ever... Like, I, I really... I just... I, I'm getting more and more tired of those boring extra deck monsters. That's just me, though. I would say I'm getting tired of them, but I have never used them. I've never summoned a Dispater. I've never summoned a Chaos Angel. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't summoned them. I haven't even summoned an Access Code Talker. Come on, Paul. Where's my Access Code Talker? Yeah, that's true. You know, like that's uh, that's another card that fits that bill. Like I, I don't like finishing people off with Access Code if I can help it. Though I think I've done that maybe once or twice. I don't know. I mean, if you get if you, I mean, I get it. If you gotta win, you gotta win. But like, yeah, I think that no. To be fair, I think if I was playing in like tournaments more. Like, you know, physical kind of in-person You beat them with what you have. You beat yeah. them with everything you got. Exactly. I think I would play them more then. But because most of my Yu-Gi-Oh! is kind of more kitchen table these days, or maybe getting on Master Duel, um, a lot more getting on Master Duel, I, I, I try to avoid those cards because I have more agency in the situation. So Nowadays, uh, there's so many of those 60-card pile decks that, is, that have the same extra deck as each other. Every, I, I keep hearing people say... You know, they love the creativity and yeah. um, the ingenuity that goes into these decks. And it's like, but it, aren't your decks essentially like 40 of the same cards as each other? And then maybe like 20 that it might be a little different, but then all your extra decks are the same. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have respect for people, I think, who can like pilot those combo decks under the high pressure that like a YCS maybe delivers. Mm-hmm. Like, it seemed like that would be really difficult to do in, like, day two, right? Fair. Where, like, everyone's playing at, like, the razor's edge, and, you know, people know every combo, and they know every choke point, and, like, there's just a lot of pressure and stuff. But at the same time, like, I'm, I don't love combo decks too much, and I don't love the same extra deck monsters showing up in, like, my plays. But I guess you could argue if you're playing, like, a main deck deck. I'm, like, I'm always summoning Rescue Ace Turbulence if I play Rescue Ace still. Uh, that's all so. you do. All you don't want to do is set three. Yeah, four. Four. So, <laughs> you want to set four. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, it's just, it's a taste and preferences thing. But either way, Phantom Nightmare, looking pretty cool. We'll try to get out to our sneak peek, I suppose. And I'm going to try. report back to you guys next week. With Hopefully with a mat. 
Yeah, with our findings. Yeah, hopefully you'll get a mat and I guess poplars. And I'll hopefully get um, some voiceless guards. Look, if and if I don't get them, that's cool. The proxies are on their way. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> they, look, the order's been in. I'm just waiting. I also figure this is a pretty good time to announce that we're going to be attending um, an event called TCG Con in Houston. Oh, yeah. That's on February, I believe, the 10th and 11th. Mm-hmm. We are going to be attending as guests. If you guys happen to be in the Houston, Texas area, or just kind of the general Texas area, willing to travel a couple hours, you can attend the event. And if you use the code APS when you check out on their website, you can actually get 20% off. I was asked to uh, remind you guys about that. So it's so a cool thing. Go to ahead. Catch us in Texas. We're going to be trading. We're going to be dueling. You know, we'll be doing the whole thing. Yeah, it'll be fun. You'll be able to, um, it'll be me, Alec, Trell, Larry, and Chris will all That's be That's right. And this will be so. the only way I can play in a Digimon tournament. So I'm happy. Yeah, not too many Digimon tournaments, but maybe well, more happen. of that later. I just can't get into them. Okay, so that's Phantom Nightmare. Now, there hasn't been, like, a lot more TCG news. I did see that um, some remote duel events were happening the past weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if that was, like, remote duel, like, camera. I know that they did speed duel, duel links, and master duel remote duel events. Right. Unfortunately, that's, like, all I can really say. Like, I want to say I saw regional lists going around, but... All I can say for sure is I saw topping this going around. I, I thought were, they were regional. I checked. But there were a couple more. The last of the Age of Overlord regional season was, okay. was this past weekend as well. So I did so, see regional this. Okay. So Yu-Gi-Oh! kind of, it's in full swing. Stuff's going on. Cards um, are being flung. Weird decks are winning. Did you ever play in a remote duel event? I know you've done some for Digimon. No, I've never done a Yu-Gi-Oh! remote duel. Mostly because I never, I did not feel confident manipulating a deck on camera okay I, you know i've played in a few YCSs, mm-hmm. you know just a few and i tend to make mistakes that uh wouldn't be that wouldn't look good on camera yeah so <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to put myself through that yeah what sort of mistakes maybe hmm. <clears throat> i just do, look i don't want to get dq'd you know yeah that, that's known to happen i <laughs> I think, like, for me, I've played in a couple of remote duel things. I remember playing in the very first, like, kind of remote duel invitational thing that they did. I remember that. That was very fun. Uh, I had a pretty good time with that. But I played in, like, one other remote duel event that I can remember. Um, And it didn't go very well for me. I I think I'm just not very comfortable playing, like... Which is so so weird that Yugi Tuber isn't, like, Mm -hmm. comfortable playing on camera. But I'm not really very comfortable, like, manipulating physical cards, like, without an opponent across the table from me. It's so the, weird. What the strange part to me, because I've you know I've done Digimon remote and uh, well, I've watched Yu Gi Oh remote, and I don't know how you can really play. I, I know that people do it. I don't know how they do it because it's such an interactive game mm-hmm. of reacting to what your opponent's doing, reading their cards, and but they're not there. Those cards are not in front of you. Um, so the thing I was going to say it's the reading part. Yeah, that, that just like baffles me. Because, like, I can see how maybe somebody could play, like, I guess, Magic or Digimon. I don't play those personally, but, like, I feel like those don't have as much, like, pick up your opponent's card and read it. Would I be correct in assuming? I mean, it, it can happen, but there's not a lot you can do during your opponent's turn. So the only thing you have to yeah. confirm is, are they resolving their effects properly? That's it. Yeah, with Yu-Gi-Oh!, there's, like, such a, there's way more of a, like, need to, like, just kind of pick up stuff and double check like, in mm-hmm. both turns. So that always kind of turned me off a little bit from remote dueling because I can't, like, kind of just ask my opponent, hey, can I read the card? You just have to know or, like, look it up on the side. But then if you look it up on the side, like on Neuron, like, that's, I don't, I think that's allowed, but, like, there might be, because they don't know how much they want you to use your phone. Uh, Well, I don't know. I wouldn't trust it. (laughs) So, like, I don't know. I've always been sort of, like, just anxious about um, playing in those remote duel events. But I did try to do one. I was trying to get, like, the, the prize reward ticket points things or whatever. I remember offering to be your dual spirit, where I sit next to you just off camera. And well, that's uh, illegal. Don't, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Although, like, I've heard reports that apparently people like maybe they do. That I mean, too, I so. would, I would never pull that. I couldn't even pull it off in college, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't pull it off here either. Yeah, I. That's um, a different story, guys. What was I going to say? I okay. So, remote dual events have happened. Mm-hmm. Now, there's one other thing that's been kind of cool that they've been announcing in the TCG is a lot of judge mats. I don't oh, know if you've yeah. seen them. They did. There was like. I don't have them pulled up, but just I've seen them on social media. There's like a an Infernoble mat that they Fire. revealed. I think there's a Ubel, not Ubel, 
Maybe it's like a voiceless voice one or something. I haven't seen it. Something. And one of the ones that I thought was really cool was there's like a pot. Uh, oh, a the pot, pot of greed the, or the or pot collection. It's a pot one. collection play it's mat. It's sick. And it's a win a mat prize too, if you can believe mm. that. So um, I might put up a, an image on screen if I can find it. I remember um, when win mats weren't popular. And so you could just go and get one. Yeah, I think the win mats are like the kind of low key best reason to like go to YCS just enter those little eight man winamats and I mean, like but the whole the side event secret is out like yeah. people show up to YCSs and they just run side events yeah now. they farm them like but i remember i remember the good old days yeah when side events were for like scrubby players like us to mm-hmm. maybe try to like scrape up a, a free matter too all you had to, the whole goal was to try and sign up and get into a side event before the competitive players started dropping out <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there. Or if you have a group of friends, you can all like take up a lot of the slots. Just run a flight. But anywho, yeah, so um that's pretty much it TCG land wise. A quick product announcement that I saw though was that Hypeland is releasing these Yu-Gi-Oh Sherpas. Sherpa. So don't know if you've seen that. Uh I'm not familiar. Yeah, so Hypeland, they are releasing these Sherpa fleeces. Uh I'll put up an image. On the on the video, oh, that's kind of dope. Yeah, so I don't know how many of you guys are really into Sherpa fleeces, but there is a blue eyes white dragon one, there's a dark magician one, and a dark magician girl. So you know the typical kind of best selling trio, right? Um, red eyes conspicuously absent, disrespectful. But hopefully, I can maybe get my hands on one of these. Of the three, which one would you say that you like the most? I like none of them. You don't like them? Okay. I, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's really not my style. Oh, okay. You don't uh, think you... More more so than anything else, it's not my style. If it is your style, I think they're great. It's just... I think if it was me, I'd probably wear the... Dark Magician one seems like it might be a thing for me. The, uh... It... You know, I'm just not partial to Dark Magician or Blue Eyes mm-hmm. like that. Or even Dark Magician Girl. I'm a Red Eyes boy. It had, look, had Red Eyes been there, I would have locked in Red Eyes even though I would never wear a Sherpa fleece. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing I noticed is that the Dark Magician Girl one does have the cleavage. So Uncensored, y'all. So, mm. I don't know. You know, if you're into that. Uh, that way, guys, that means you can have cleavage on front and back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um... So, yeah, pick up your Hypeland Sherpa fleeces. It seems like they're actually out. Uh, they were out a few days ago, apparently. So oh, I, I, I thought this later. was something that was coming out, but apparently they actually already are out. So, Well, now here's another interesting little announcement as well. Um, you might remember last week, Konami had sort of said that there was going to be a quarter century like live stream yeah, thing, but they didn't yes. really give any details. Well, they've... Presented the eight duelists that will be participating in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel second anniversary invitational. Ooh. And your boy is one of them. Trail made it in? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be I'll be playing in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel second anniversary invitational alongside Joshua Schmidt, Jesse mm. Cotton, Rhyme Style, C Reacts, Chilled Chaos, Crip, and uh, Paolo Gonzalez. So I don't know all the names on there, but I heard a few that I recognize. That's a strong, that's, that's some strong players. Yeah, I hope I got those names right. I was kind of just, you know, there's so many pronunciations in the world these days. But the point is, those are going to be the eight people. I think it's going to be a team event like last time. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I, I guess I can't reveal the teams. I already know, so I'm just not going to yeah, say anything probably, about you, should, you shouldn't say You guys will probably know Much soon. more than what you are. But just let it be what known, What I can y'all. say is, it will be similar to last year's event. Paul is a returning champ of the last event. I think that's so, giving me a bit of credit. My team won last year. The team that I was on Paul won. has a trophy from the last one, and he's looking to get a second. I do have a trophy. <laughs> yeah, my team did win last year. It was largely thanks to Pac, but uh, he's not playing this year, so I don't know if I'll be able to count on him. to. Um, this, mean, this means you got to win a game now. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, it does seem like this is kind of exciting because it's going to most likely pit Jesse Cotton up against Joshua Schmidt. Which is that's a, a that's sort a grudge of match. super duper top level Yu Gi Oh rivalry grudge match, you know, best player in Europe versus best player in North America. Um, so hopefully that will get to happen. I think people will be really as a fellow to it. North American. I know I should be 
rooting for Jesse, but there's just something about Joshua Schmidt's like personality. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to root for this guy. I don't care what he competes in. I mean, he certainly makes more like content. So I think a lot more people are familiar with him now. That's true. As far as like, That's you true. know, what it is. He, he does more, con- he does do more content. Yeah. So I think this will be really cool. Um, they're supposed to also be having announcements for, Dual links and the TCG. Mm. I know they did say they're going to be doing like a UDS championship playoff. Yes, the cr- so, to crown the ultimate champion. So that'll be really cool. I think they're going to have like the belts involved. That would probably be really cool if they did because UDS used to have like a belt or something. That will be the sweatiest Yu Gi Oh we've ever seen. Yeah, I look forward to it. And it also sounds like from the um, announcement that they're going to be playing anime episodes during the live mm. stream. So it seems like it's going to be like a three day long stream where events like you know, Master Duel and Duel Link and stuff will happen. And then between those events, players will be able to just sit back and watch some Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. And that's such a surprise from Konami because they don't seem to be, like, showing too much anime nowadays. Yeah, sometimes it feels like the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG is a bit decoupled from the anime in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways. So the fact that they're going to be showing this, I think, is a good way of pulling everyone together a little bit. Like, I think that the goal would be to have some casual kind of, I remember Yu-Gi-Oh! as a kid thing, where like a casual person sort of sees the anime episodes and they just kind of watch for that. And then they happen to stay for like some of the Duel Links or the Master Duel or the TCG gameplay as well. Make, that makes sense. That makes and I think in doing so, they might be like, oh, I kind of want to play this again. Like, I, I didn't know Yu-Gi-Oh! was still played. So I think in that way, if it works out like that, that would be a good so it sounds like a fun weekend of Yu-Gi-Oh. I hope there's some cool um, like product announcements that might show up during. Yeah, if we don't get them in that, then we might be getting them at the Tokyo Dome event. That's true, because that's coming up either this week or next week. That's actually like this next, next week. weekend. Um, I need to look up the exact details, but um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the Tokyo Dome, why that's so yeah, relevant. Yeah, uh, so the Tokyo Dome event that's, that's about to happen was announced at our last world tournament. That was much to the chagrin of a lot of Western players because um, we don't really have any connection to the Tokyo Dome or why that's such a uh, momentous occasion and event. Yeah, it's February 3rd and 4th, by the way. February 3rd? Okay. Yeah. So it really is coming up. But um, that's because the Tokyo Dome is not known for ever hosting Yu-Gi-Oh! events, except for one time. Paul, do you remember the last time Yu-Gi-Oh was at the Tokyo Dome event? Yeah, or, so yeah, it was like apparently in 19, like 99 or something like that. It was like a very early event where they had hmm. like some promo cards that you could only get at the Tokyo Dome. And um, Tokyo Dome, by the way, I think is sort of the equivalent of the Madison Square Garden kind of of like the United States. Very um, just notorious kind of place to hold an event. Mm-hmm. And there were riots there, actually, because people were not able to get their... Um, they weren't able to get their cards, their promo cards. They, like, ran out of them. I don't and remember what the promos were, but they yeah, did there not were have enough. Yeah, crowds, and that was a whole thing. And so now, I guess, them returning to the Tokyo Dome sort of feels like a um, everything coming full circle. <laughs> I don't know. It's, we're putting the ghosts to rest. Yeah. <laughs> you don't stand a ghost of a chance. But, um... No, no, it, it is, it's a very uh, exciting event for the Japanese players. And at least, if nothing else, it's an interesting event for us TCG players just because... There'll, see, there'll be some product announcements. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm, like, I'm pretty sure we're going to see product announcements. Now, granted, um, most of those product announcements would probably be OCG-focused. Would be, I mean, you know... Uh, hey, that's what we... Thing. We're always watching but those anyway. <laughs> yeah, but we're still always watching that, and so that means we'll probably... That might be where we finally get the information on... Um, Infinite, uh, what is it called? Infinite Forbidden. Infinite Forbidden, or any other large Yu-Gi-Oh projects we might be working on. That could be anime, video games. People are fingers like, crossed. People are thinking that there might be something like you know a master rule announcement or something. Oh, I, I, hope I somehow not. doubt it. What would they do? I mean, because I I, I feel like they've more than learned their lesson about adding in extra. Like card types, just for the heck of it. Looking at you, pendulums and links. Yeah, frankly, I don't think I really want to uh, get like a new master rule or anything. But I will certainly be watching the Tokyo Dome event. Um, hopefully, there will be something exciting to see. Mm-hmm. You know, that goes on there. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much kind of our TCG news. Digitally, there's a little bit going on in Master Duel. Uh, specifically, like two things. So. Um, 
Last week, they actually released a new band list the day that the podcast went out, so we weren't able to talk about it. It is very short, um, extremely short, actually. So short that it's really not worth... I mean, I don't think there's so much to say. So they didn't hit... hit uh, so they didn't hit Maxi. No, 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 of course not. But um, they instead have limited Bestial Serenir, which is one of the cards in the Bestial Engine. Um, an interesting one, it's the one that lets you send a branded card to your graveyard. Mm-hmm. So pretty useful in the branded deck for sending your branded fusion to the grave or also sending... Yeah, I know you're probably not super familiar with this stuff, but it's like sending... Um, Oh, what is that one branded trap? The, the branded trap lets you recycle other branded cards. You could send um, branded regain if you want to like reset it with branded beast. It's a good card. Long oh, story okay, short. good, good card. And good it's card guy. really useful in the branded deck, and also maybe like a dragon link hybrid or something like that. Got it. So that's limited to one. They also limited labyrinth shen drag Lear. Ah, they hit um, the furniture to two. So uh, Ooh, the that's furniture, a small hit. yeah, a pretty small hit. It's it joins Stoby Torby, so um, they're both at two. And then Conquistador of the Golden Land, which is now actually uh, back to two, I think. Oh, it's okay, like one or something. I was like, wait, Conquistador, it was already hit. Yeah, and that's crazy. It's been hit as long as it has. I know, like Eldritch was a real menace early in Master Duel, but I mean, it was just a solid deck. I played it. I, you know, I played. I played a lot of Eldritch. I just sorry, it went Duel. from it was at two and now it's unlimited. Oh, okay, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which, so which still makes sense. Yeah, but I was like, Eldritch does not need to be hit anymore. Yeah, so those are the only three changes. I know people are kind of disappointed. They wanted Super Heavy Samurai and, like, I mean, stuff don't get, get another list in two weeks. I mean... Yeah, that's it's Master it's Duel. It's Master Duel. It'll probably happen sooner rather than later. Or it might take until the next Duelist Cup, which I don't know if we have any information on that. But that's usually where they make the bigger lists is after right. the Duelist Cups. So... So what was the second thing? You said there was two things going on. Okay, second thing is that they're doing a dual trial event, which is kind of like a festival, but they're like usually shorter. They only last like three days or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and the dual trial right now is actually the TCG ban list. So you get to play Master Duel with the TCG ban list. Oh, with a couple of exceptions. Because we like, don't have all the cards. Well, like Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, for instance, still isn't in the game. So like that's not legal for this. But the bigger deal is more so that Maxi is banned, which a lot of people, you know, especially in the, here in the TCG side, do not like Maxi and Master Duel. So getting to play with Maxi gone is refreshing for a lot of people. So they seem they, to be enjoying that. Did they at least hit the super heavy link? Uh, I don't know. I actually, I, I hope so, so. I, I think so. I have not actually played this event. I saw that it was happening, and um, I'm kind of in like a short master duel hiatus right now mm-hmm. i got my master one rank i'm, I'm done for a bit <laughs> now i'll be playing again soon because like the you know season's about to reset and everything but like yeah i haven't played this event so i don't really know like what decks are like doing super well or anything like that i just know that people seem to be enjoying not dealing with maxi i mean if you look at it as a test bed maybe they're trying to see uh how players respond to playing without maxi though i still don't think maxi is going anywhere yeah, probably not in the main format. I mean, I think that there's, just in general, a lot of testing being done with Master Duel. Like, Master Duel has the Dragon Rulers like, three now. Yeah. And, like, they're not seeing play. And so that's one of those things that maybe the TCG might have been a little bit more um, weary of doing. But, like, in Master Duel, as a digital game, they can gather a lot more data. Mm. And maybe that could inform future TCG decisions speaking of digital Yu-Gi-Oh, i got a little bit to say about duel links okay so duel links has its quarter century campaign going and it's released a new structure deck for speed duel links it's a it's a chronicle based one you might be familiar with chronicle magician yeah for dark magician yeah yeah it works at dark magician and blue eyes okay but you i bet you're not familiar with chronicle sorceress I don't know about that. One. Because that's not in the TCG yet. But oh. because Duel Links is digital, it actually already got her. Okay. So we, we got a structure deck that works with Blue Eyes and Dark Magician. I doubt they'll see too much competitive use, but they're good boosts in, uh, for Blue Eyes and Dark Magician. There's also some pretty solid reprints for both decks in that structure deck, so that's pretty cool. But also... We got the uh, the new box. It's a new mini box. Okay. It includes uh, Galaxy Tachyon 
the 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 guy. I don't know what he's called. Tachyon Yacht Dragon. Dra- Tachyon Dragon. That thing. It okay. has him. And it oh, he has, wasn't in Duel Links before. Interesting. No, I, I, don't, I guess they thought it was too strong. I mean, it is a new scale and everything, so that Galaxy deck is going to be a lot better. But also, we got zombies with Bear Drock. Oh, okay. it's in the game. It's here you love that. now. I do. I've already pulled copies of of lots of things. I'm working on my deck. I'm not really sure how it's going to uh, shake out, but really excited to play Zombie World Zombies in Duel Links. But there has been some worrying news going around today for Duel Links. What's the worrying news? I have not heard about this. Yeah, uh, so people are having trouble with uh, making payments in Duel Links. It's not that you can't. Oh, no. Like you, you can definitely give them your money. But a lot of people are not receiving all the all of the items they're supposed to get in their bundles. Some people aren't getting all the cards they're supposed to get get oh, when they buy. I had not heard about this. Some okay. people are making a single order, receiving multiple, and then being charged multiple, multiple copies of the same. Oh, that's crazy! Mm-hmm. I never. Hmm, interesting. And so, with I would I would warn everyone to you know just uh. If you're if you are getting into the new update and you really want stuff, I say make a small purchase first to see if your um to see if you whatever your dual links client is is working properly. I mean, I would be a little bit. I don't think I would even make a purchase until well, I, get I like did. A, I made plenty. Did you get affected by this? No, I was fine. Okay, well, but there were a lot of reports of it. Yeah, I, I would be like careful then. I guess if you're uh, if you're a dual links player, maybe don't maybe like wait until like an update comes out just in case. I just wouldn't want anybody to like lose. They're, you know, like lose your money to this sort of thing. Some people said the problem. I mean, no was more than Duel Links is already taking your money. Sure, that is, it, 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 it be hitting your wallet. It just, it just be. But some people say that um, the product that it might have already been fixed, and we just don't, we just can't see it. But um, hmm. I don't. I haven't seen anything officially saying, "Hey, we fixed the problem." So I don't know. Yeah, that's bizarre and worrying. Um, it's interesting. That's like a, a funny like. There's a problem mm-hmm. with monetization. Konami's not getting enough money. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we have to fix this. I just thought it was funny because at first I thought it meant people were getting things for free. I thought they were putting in like $5 and getting like $15 worth of stuff. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that <laughs> never happens whenever <laughs> there's like a whenever there's like a financial thing like with companies? It's never <laughs> um it's so rarely like, "Oh, I put in like, you know, $10 and got a free TV." It's always like I paid for a TV and got nothing. Or like, <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> they like triple charged always, me. <laughs> oh, no, they, yeah, they charged my card twice, and they don't know how it happened. I had to go through like three customer service calls to finally get it resolved. But um, hopefully Duel Links can resolve that. That would be that would be good. You seem like you've been playing a little bit of Duel Links lately. How's that I, been? I have been. It's been. I've been having a blast. A lot of, I've been doing a lot of rush duels. I've been doing a lot of speed duels. Um, because I don't play often, I have a lot of like grinding to do as far as like leveling characters and unlocking uh, leveling my worlds and unlocking characters and leveling them to get all the cards that they have. But it's been a, it's been a good time. It's been a good time. I actually have it right here. Oh, the phone's off, but it, it was right here. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you're playing Duel Links. It does always feel like Duel Links is uh, just in such a weird spot. Like I just never. I'm not like I don't see a lot of people. You know, making the content. I've pointed this out before, but it does seem like the game itself like is. Doing fine. Duelings has content creators, but it is certainly in a niche unless you're a part of like the tournament Same. from the the crypto money circuit thing they got going on. That's that's oh, yeah, like kind of the decade does. Yeah, that's for the most part. That's what Duelings is. is now, if you travel like south and you go into South America, you actually see there's actually a, a very large uh, like South American audience too. They have their own creators. I was yeah. watching a video today in either Portuguese or fast speaking Spanish. I couldn't tell which. My my Spanish is not good enough, but um, they have their own creators. I know I watch a lot of Ren and Sparrow. I yes, know he, um, does a lot of dueling stuff. That's cool. I mean, I just, I think with Duel Links, something that I've kind of begun to appreciate more about it recently is that it is more anime focused mm-hmm. compared to Master Duel, which is basically pretends the anime just doesn't exist. So, um, and I, I mean, that's by design, but it's kind of cool to be able to like play with your favorite characters. It, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I didn't even watch Zexel, but for the first time, because I was trying to unlock cards, I triggered Yuma and Astral fusing and to make their like Zexel form. And that was really cool. That was, that was actually really exciting. Um, 
it's a shame Master Duel does not have references to the anime. I think the closest thing you get to the anime in Master Duel is Yujo friendship. Yeah, I mean, I think it also just shows to some degree, though, that, like, the TCG kind of wants to be its own thing, like, mm-hmm. kind of seen as its own thing. We've talked at length about how, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! sits in this weird spot where it sort of utilizes the anime imagery, like the kind of the Yugi, the Kaiba and stuff you know, mm-hmm. and yet the TCG itself is largely divorced from them. You know, a Dark Magician deck is not winning the next YCS, right? Not even close. Or at least if it does, I'll I'll eat my foot. I don't know, but... Be, oh, what? be careful. Someone might take that challenge. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know. I think, like, that's kind of one of those... Uh, one of those weird parts about Yu-Gi-Oh! But Duel Links does not seem to run into that problem. It still uses nope, the characters still use first the anime. and foremost. Anyways, I think, if I'm correct, that's all of the Yu-Gi-Oh! news. Let's see. Unless you have seen or heard something that I have not. Nope, that's it. We covered what I had. Okay, cool. Well, I think in that case, we can get into some other like you know news stories, card games, anything happening. Sadly, I actually... Could not find much for uh, other card games. The Bandai Card Fest had just passed. Okay, anything of note there? I don't. I actually don't know. Um, there is very poor tracking of Bandai's announcements. What was it called? It's like Bandai Card Fest. Like I guess it'll be t- Bandai Card Fest. Yeah, Bandai. Okay. It's a part of their world tour, I guess, where they're holding all the nationals for their card games. That's. Uh, One Piece, Digimon, Battle Spirits, and, and I guess in, in other regions. Of my oh, okay. Games. Yeah. Bandai Card Games Fest 23-24. Um, so, yeah, this was happening, I guess, this past week. And I just wanted to see if there were maybe some announcements that... I mean, I, st- I, saw, I saw pictures. I mean, we got, we, had, we got a better idea of what the Digimon Liberator... Uh, the story and characters will look like. That's if you guys don't know, the Digimon TCG is getting an update with uh, Digimon Liberator, which is supposed to add a a story for the Digimon TCG to follow. A story, like, what does that mean? So in this, in the Digimon Liberator world, they uh, they actually the characters all play a card game, a Digimon card game, and they hop into this like virtual space to play the game where they get to play their Digimon and they can interact with their Digimon. So think like card fight Vanguard ish mm-hmm. like or like maybe like a Link Brain type situation. There's like a VR thing where they hop in and they can they play and the Digimon actually exists. Yeah. So there's basically kind of a story that is playing out through the card game. Almost Albaz Kind of Visa Star Frost esque, like it's, it's unique like, to the it's game. It's more like fourth wall breaking, but yes. Okay. Well, I see this thing, and I don't know. Forgive me if this is like old news. Um, the One Piece card game got a premium card collection, um, Bandai Fest twenty three twenty four edition. So it's this set of, I guess, premium cards. There are hollow and textured foil. There are twelve cards that you get, and you also get like a booklet, and you have to or had to pre order it. Okay, so, I think that's been out for a while. That might have been something that's like out. I didn't know if there's any news. I, I would feel bad if we See, didn't cover. Well, that's the thing. It's really hard to keep up with Bandai news. There's no one really reporting it. You have yeah. to. You have to pretty much have your eyes open on Twitter or Reddit to catch every little scrap of information. And it's not necessarily. All, it's always from a good source. I so you might only get pieces of things. I see a new Digimon mat that was, I guess, announced there. Maybe you know what this is. I don't think that is that Matt new. Yeah, they say it's new. It's official oh, okay. card game. I've seen artwork edition. before because that's the um, and pre-orders only just opened and oh, they okay. close on March first. So, uh, so there, there was a new Matt on Premium Bandai. I guess we're gonna apologize then. We just really aren't on top of the Bandai news, but I mean, but how, someone how here thought, if you're just saying yeah, how could we be? Because the thing is, this isn't for lack of trying. I tried to get. A, a good amount of knowledge from this event and it was hard to do after the event ran the twitter posts have dried up the reddit posts have fallen like further into their subreddits well somebody could maybe like in the comments if you have a um like kind of just a synopsis of sort of what happened or something that might be of interest i mean you play digimon so i know you I at do. least would have heard that bit of i news. saw i saw what decks like competed on the digimon side i have no idea what happened on the one piece side of things yeah and does anyone know what happened in battle spirits i don't know if anyone's really following battle spirits and that's not 
a mark against the game. That just kind of feels like it's the reality. I, I know think, that Union Arena is, I guess, coming out, so that... I yeah. think all of this is really a personal failing on Bandai's marketing. If no one is tracking their news releases and formally make, like writing articles about them, it sounds like Bandai is doing something wrong. Here's one interesting thing that I just found. Hmm. So um, the tournament is free. Like, admission tournament admission was free, apparently. But participants will be able to purchase event commemorative items only by pre-ordering them in advance and then picking up their order at the venue. So obviously this has already happened, but that seems kind of weird, huh? That sounds like ba- sounds like Bandai to me. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like I, I, just, I guess like I would think that going to the event would be enough to be able to like pick up your no. They got to monetize. Item. What so, you mean? Well, no, it's, it's not the monetization I have a problem with because like you have to obviously buy things at any event like this. It's more like. You had to pre-order your thing and then pick it up at the event. And that just rubs me. They didn't want to have too many. Yeah, so I guess it's really a very, like, you know, made-to-order kind of situation or something. Anyways, I don't know. I don't follow a lot of Bandai news. I'll tell you, there is a little bit of other card game news. This one's a little bit more unfortunate. So, MetaZoo Games abruptly closes up shop. I don't know if you've Mm. heard of the card game MetaZoo. I have heard. But um, MetaZoo, it's a... TCG, um, yeah, so it's by Cryptid Nation. That sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, MetaZoo Games abruptly announced that they're shutting down on January 29th, 2024. The company has also wiped their social media pages, but the website remains up. Like the cryptids in their MetaZoo TCG, MetaZoo Games has more or less attempted an overnight vanishing act. The company's founder, Michael Waddell, revealed the news on their Discord in a statement before it was shut down. What else stated the following in the release? So they say, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the community for the incredible four year run that we had, wrote Waddell. Unfortunately, that era has passed, and faced with logistical and product gridlocks, MetaZoo Games can no longer exist in the current economic and collectibles markets. It is my hope that MetaZoo can continue on as an IP at some point in the future under new ownership, and I look forward to that day. Mm. So, um, did you? What was your experience with MetaZoo? Do you know? Like, I'm not gonna. I lie. remember when MetaZoo came out. Yeah, I remember around the time that it came out was like uh, maybe 2020, 2021. Um, I remember we were at like an event, uh, yep. a TCG day or something. It was in Texas, and they had a booth, and so I kind of got a look at it there. Can't say I've ever played it. It did not strike me as a particularly like appealing game i just didn't i couldn't get into the artwork yeah i thought the cards were ugly um yeah not to say the gameplay was bad because i didn't play it i just thought the car the cards did not appeal to me i thought they looked ugly and um but it had a lot of positive buzz online as far as their tournament circuit people always talked about their prize support being a huge draw that you can win real cash prizes yeah i don't know if that was True or not, I mean, I suppose it was. Um, that was something I'd heard them talk about at their booth was like, yeah, you know, there's cash prizes. And it is always an enticing thing to card game players. It's kind of the idea of, um, you know, like Yu-Gi-Oh, for instance, does not offer cash prizes. You get mm-hmm. you can get like plenty of deck boxes and mats and things like that, and maybe a prize card, but Yu-Gi-Oh will not offer you hard, cold cash for winning. And so um, when you look at games that do, it can seem like, oh, man, I'd rather play Pokemon or Magic and get some money for it. Because um, I remember, I, I saw a few posts about uh, MetaZoo winners actually winning money, and they were very happy, so they made like, little Twitter posts about it. Uh, I was glad to see that they won, like, real money and not crypto. Yeah, it sounds like that was, I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, trying to think, I mean, was there anything else that I remember of MetaZoo? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, just, I don't think that it stuck out to me very much as a game. I'm sure mm-hmm. there are people who probably miss, you know, they're, they're kind of upset to hear this. I wonder what he means by, like, you know, the current economic and collectibles markets. That, because there's, like, two things that come to mind for me. The first is just that there's, like, a lot of card games out right now. It's a crowded space. So it, it's really crowded. It's tough to stand out um, on the shelf and, like, in the discourse, in the news, mm-hmm. you know, having a venue for your tournaments, having regionals, having a circuit. Like, a, an organized play structure seems difficult to have and difficult to maintain. Um I know I saw MetaZoo cards actually at, like, Target stores, if you can believe that. So, I mean, it at least pierced. Yeah, they got to the retail market. Yeah, it did pierce into retail. Now, would I buy a MetaZoo pack if I saw it on the shelf? I don't think so. It did not stick out to me But you're not much. the intended audience. Yeah. 
Or who is? Maybe, I, I don't know. Either. I don't know who the intimate audience I is. I felt like they were targeting like kind of disenfranchised competitive TCG players who yeah. wanted to compete and they but they wanted to actually earn something for competing. Well, MetaZoo was a one of a handful of TCGs that gained popularity uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic era. They gained significant traction in the hobby games market in August 2021, where they managed to break the top 10 on the TCG player sealed TCG product chart. Prior to appearing on that chart at number 7, the company had gained superstar DJ Steve Aoki as a full equity partner. Oh, wow. Um, more recently, MetaZoo Games had licensed Hello Kitty for the Karomi's Cryptid Carnival, which is like a crossover set, I think. Oh, okay. Um, so they, had, I mean, it sounds like up so until they, mean, they were recently, making they were moves. doing stuff. Unfortunately, the abrupt end to MetaZoo Games and the complete erasure of the company's social media pages leaves more questions than it answers. MetaZoo TCG seemed to be moving right along through the end of 2023 as Karomi's Cryptid Carnival had recently hit target shelves, a set that had also snagged a spot on the TCG player chart in October. From the outside looking in, it appeared to be business as usual for the average TCG company. The statement announcing their closing mentioned that more information would be released via their Discord channel when it became, became available. So yeah, it seems like it's a pretty abrupt thing. Yeah, it doesn't sound like the writing was necessarily on the walls. I mean, I don't know too many MetaZoo players, but I remember when it was at its height while growing, you couldn't really escape people talking about, hey, man, that MetaZoo, you ever heard about MetaZoo? MetaZoo's that game, man. MetaZoo, you can actually win real cash prizes, bro. Well, maybe the cash prize thing was what did them in. Like, it's pretty tough to pay cash prizes out if, like, your games, I don't know, like, what attendance was like at these events, Mm -hmm. but my guess would maybe be that, like, well, you know, like, let's say I'm paying out, like, you know, $5,000 or something to first place. I'm just throwing a number out there. I don't know. Right. Someone who's maybe played MetaZoo can fill us in a little bit more. But, like, if people are playing, like, if you only are maybe getting, like, 80 entrants or something, even if they're paying, like, <laughs> 30 or 40 but however much it was to enter, like, it still could be pretty tough to maintain that on top of the costs of venues and It's like those uh, 10Ks that don't reach nearly enough players to pay out 10K. Yeah, and usually with those sorts of tournaments, I've noticed whenever there's, like, a Magic 10K or something like that, it's usually, like, there's, like, an asterisk, and it's, like, contingent <laughs> on, you know, the proper amount yeah, of people. Yeah, no people for 10K. Otherwise, look, it's... it's Otherwise, like, it might be, like, a... The three and a half K, K, all right? <laughs> a K. So, eh, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I guess pour one out for MetaZoo or don't. If you, Rip, I mean, rest you know, in I peace. It might not be the only game that goes... That way, all right. Too. Don't look at me and think Digimon while saying that. All right, well, no, I wasn't thinking of Digimon, but Dragon Ball Super should die first. I don't know, they're getting a new update or something. Isn't like, that we're getting liberators, so one of us has to fall. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it does bring me back though to just that like very competitive card game market. That it is that like all these games are fighting through, you know, Yu Gi Oh! and stuff, they don't have to really worry about it. They're big three, they'll be fine, but like. Man, some of these other games, it's rough because you're always talking about how like it feels like One Piece has kind of oh, it, it's theme cannibalized. Yeah, like like uh, in mo, I would I would has to say in most places, One Piece has completely supplanted Digimon's place in their shops. Now, the, don't get me wrong, there are shops that have Digimon still. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But you never see a shop that runs both and. More it's often than not, I'm seeing, you know, One Piece on their signage, One Piece on their websites. Yeah. I don't see a lot of Digimon anymore. Yeah. And that feels rough, too, given that, like, they're both Bandai games, so. Yeah. But Bandai can't stop re- uh, making TCGs, and they won't stop. Yeah, as we know, they've got Union Arena around the corner. Stop so. reminding me. I want to forget. Yeah. And whatever the new update to Dragon Ball is, I forget the name of it, but that's also a thing, so. There's really a lot. Like, I... I can see where a game like MetaZoo might just feel like it's it's just tough to... Just too crowded of a market. It's crowded. It's really, really crowded. Um, for those of you, actually, I have a question for listeners. Um, if you want to kind of throw this in a comment on YouTube or something like that. What is the card game distribution at your local card shop like? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Like, just... And, and by distribution, I don't really mean, like, what's on the shelves, although I guess that could be relevant, but... Or, like, the most popular games, right? Yeah, more like, what's played? Like, what does the weekly tournament structure look like? What do people seem to get most excited about? What games do you have, like, formal events for from the developers? Like, from Bandai, mm-hmm. from Konami, from Wizards, versus maybe just not... 
I think a good example, let's, let's say like our shop. Uh, let's yeah. What's the breakdown? Because you go more often than me. Pokemon buy buy a lot. Uh, they have very large uh, weeklies. Like how large? <laughs> Couldn't even begin to tell you. I can't yeah. count. Or what, rather, what's the demographic? Is it? Oh, it's it certainly skews younger, but we we also have older Pokemon players too. Mm-hmm. But it just makes for a very large group, a very large and consistent group of players. So they're number one. They're followed pr- like decently close by Magic, except Magic has people that play different formats. So while we have plenty of Magic players at our shop, they don't all play Commander. They don't all play Pioneer. They don't all play Modern. So what's the most popular? Commander is the most popular. Commander is most popular. But mm-hmm. you you can see that everyone has their own way of playing Magic. And then in third place is. It feels like One Piece, I feel. Like, I feel it like Yu-Gi-Oh! Be. and One Piece kind of, like, wrestle for third. I haven't seen too many of the One Piece events. They changed our days, so I don't see them anymore. But One Piece was, if nothing else, it was consistent. It was more consistent than Digimon was. So I know that they're ahead of Digimon. Yeah. So it's probably it probably goes, like, tied Yu-Gi-Oh! and One Piece, and then Digimon it ba- is barely worth mentioning. Perhaps our upcoming sneak peek will change Yu-Gi-Oh!'s place in the rankings sneak peeks bring people out from the woods yeah they really do that's why that's why i say i think like maybe the sneak peek will help look at it paul's gonna go to a Yu-Gi-Oh event in our shop he never does that Uh, not often just straight from the woods well the one time i went i remember i went to the card shop um kind of recently and they're they're like yeah there's like a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament today and then like there wasn't one (laughs) and so and you know i just so People joke a lot about like how like oh like Paul should like play more like locally in person, but mm-hmm. the times that I've tried in recent memory, there just hasn't actually been a tournament happening. I mean, I this was like kind of a few months ago that I went and there wasn't a tournament, and then like even last week, um, I remember going by the card shop on what was supposed to be tournament night, and there wasn't a tournament going on, and so I think like it kind of speaks to it can be a little difficult to like get people to want to play a certain game or like kind of agree on a date to play it. Yeah. So that's why I want to know from the audience, like what games are doing well or perhaps not doing well at your own local scene. Yeah, let us know. It's always something that's intriguing to hear, and I will certainly read the comments. As you guys know, I do that. Anyways, though, yeah, shoutouts to MetaZoo or not. Um, might not be much more to talk about with them, but maybe someone will pick it up in the future. That's what they suggested. That's the hope. In their post. Okay. Cool. Um, what else we got? So I have some gaming news, and not necessarily card gaming news. Okay, is this like state of play or just? No, uh, this is just this is just uh, something I picked up last week after okay. the pod. So Activision's Call of Duty general manager takes over as president of Blizzard. Oh, okay. So what does this mean I don't follow these things? So, I mean, you know, how Blizzard's had their uh, yeah. People don't like issues. Blizzard. They've people had people had don't like issues. Blizzard. They don't like Activision. Well. They sent over the GM from Call of Duty to try and save it. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad sign. Well, what's the story you got to tell us? Here we go. Let's get it from the source here. (laughs) Blizzard Entertainment has announced that its new president, Joanna or Johanna Fares, Fares, who previously spent nearly three years as the general manager of Activision's Call of Duty franchise, Fares... Yeah, I guess fairies will replace Mike Yabara, who unexpectedly announced his departure when Microsoft laid off 1,900 employees from its gaming division last week. Okay. In an email sent to Blizzard employees, fairies said Activision Blizzard and King, King? Don't know what that is. And King are decidedly different companies with distinct games, cultures, and communities, and as she's taking on the new position with sensitivity to those dynamics and deep respect for Blizzard, she might be the only one who has respect for Blizzard. And this is a quote. I am committed to doing everything I can to help Blizzard thrive with care and consideration for you and for our games, each unique and special in their own right. What? Okay, what does that have to do with the games? Like, I'm optimistic about our ability to serve our current and future player communities and to further amplify the shared passion for greatness, oh polish, gosh, okay. and creative mastery what does it, that okay. is the hallmark of Blizzard's approach to game making. Joy, what's like, so? What's it mean? Like, I mean, what's she going to say? That she's going to do not? a good job. All right. I mean, I'm. I I just I, I've never. I don't know. Changing, like, management and stuff for these companies and stuff doesn't, like, 
what are you gonna do? Like, like tell, that's what that's all I really want to hear. Like, because I know people do not like Activision and or and or Blizzard. People do not like Activision Blizzard. They're not um, too popular. And I mean, I hear bad things about pretty much every game that comes out of them. It feels like people did not like the last Call of Duty. People don't like Overwatch. People complain about Diablo. Like, I've I've heard that it's just pretty rough over there. Well, don't worry because someone from Call of Duty is coming over and they're gonna save. Overwatch, they're gonna save uh, what is that game called? World of Warcraft. They're gonna save. I don't know if World of Warcraft needs saving, by the way. I have no, I don't know. Well, she's about in that, charge of it, so she's gonna save it. Okay, well, good for her. I wish her good luck. Let's talk about the state of play. Sure, why not? Something um, of no. Let's talk about some actual games here. Some real games. Okay, so, Sony so I want to talk their, about that diver game. Yeah, well, they did their <laughs> PlayStation State of Play um, yesterday when you guys are listening to this anyway. And there are a few new games that were announced. I think we should probably start by saying there weren't actually all that many. I thought there'd be more, given that this is a state of play. They're supposed to give you the state of play station. And it seems like they're not working on all that much. Yeah, there are only like eight or nine games announced, maybe something like that. Um, We'll take them one by one. So I don't okay. perfectly remember all of these, but I did watch the trailer, so... There was um, that really cool new game. What is it called? Stellar Blade. Oh, yeah. The one by Shift Up, makers of Nikkei. Yeah. So tell us about it because you, you play yeah, Nikkei. So uh, Shift, Up, Shift Up is a Korean gaming company. And uh, since I know them from, from Nikkei, it made a lot of sense that they made a game centering around a female protagonist in a, like, dystopian post-apocalyptic world where some alien-like creatures have run humans underground, which if you've played Nikkei, that's essentially the same setup. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this game is actually a single-player game, and it's more like character focus on the character named Eve, and it plays as this kind of action adventure kind of game. You, We've seen this kind of gameplay before, but never with... Um, with such a focus on all the costumes you can put the main character in. Well, it does say that Eve will use guns and swords in stylish action combat. Um, very stylish. Very. Yeah. I mean, I so when I saw this, I thought it looked pretty cool. The graphics looked great. Yeah. It was ref, it was kind of refreshing, I guess, to see um, kind of just, I don't know, like something that it wasn't like a completely like gritty world thing. Like, obviously, it's, it's apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. But like, I guess it felt more like kind of watching like an anime ish right vibe it's that, on it. That anime vibe where it doesn't feel like realistic. Yeah, it's it's not that. There's like a look that a lot of modern games have. It's so hard to put into words, but you know it when you see it. It did not exactly have that look. It kind of gave me more like near vibes. Yeah, for sure. If that you know kind of resonates, um, seems cool. It comes out on April 26th. Yeah, I'm so, I'm ex I'm excited to play it just because I like. Um, more of like RPG character led games with stories and like and actual characters with voice acting. I'm sorry, the state of play had that kind of annoyed didn't me. Didn't feel like it had enough of that. There was a lot of just. We'll the, get more into it. Don't you worry. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we'll continue. Yeah, we'll continue. don't you worry. Well, you can pick it up on April 26th and be glad to know that the microtransactions that you put into Nikkei probably funded this game. So in a so, we, in a weird way, I'm like a founder. You yeah, know? you should be given like some <laughs> some stake in the game or whatever, some shares. Uh, <laughs> hope it does well. All right, so there's also Dragon's Dogma two. Wasn't interested. Yeah, I so Dragon's Dogma is pretty old, huh? Yeah, like, Dragon's that game Dogma like PS three. Yeah, like late Xbox 360, PS3, I feel like. That sounds about right. Well, that's coming out. It's by Capcom. It's coming out on March 22nd. because um, the last time I heard Dragon's Dogma name was the anime on Netflix. Oh, people, oh I remember that. that. People didn't like that one. It huh? was dog water. Yeah, people said that was not a good one. It was horrible. Yeah, I hated okay. <laughs> what was What was bad about it, if you know? Oh, my gosh. Where do I start? Was it a 3D anime? I believe there... I don't, was it, I don't think it was three-dimensional. But it was poor, regardless. I, I know people said they did not care. I did for not it. like the animation. I did not like the story. I did not like. There was not much to like about the Dragon's Dogma anime. Wait, so how much did you watch? I did. I watch the whole thing. I think I watched the whole thing. Because so Alex and I, Alex far. and I, kind of pushed through things. Okay, well, but I, I was not happy. This is a the long-awaited sequel. Now, this is an RPG game, which I know you that's. Are, maybe like your favorite genre of these to see, but, but. I didn't care for um, th this. 
Western RPGs, they always kind of bother me because they're mostly just single player, like single character, single character, just yeah, boring, bleak worlds. Not a lot. I'm a big fan of parties. Yeah, no, definitely no party. I'm a a big fan of parties in my RPGs. Like that's probably why I lean towards JRPGs. But I just I tend to like you know the idea that I'm kind of like traveling around with a group. And there's some group dynamics, both in the story and in the gameplay. And I don't mind apocalyptic worlds, but more like I just think that when you have a group, it can make an apocalyptic world suddenly feel a little more interesting than just being um, the lone person. A good example of that is uh, the, I mean, some people call it the failed Guardians of the Galaxy game. But I actually really enjoyed that game because you're traversing these largely empty planets that only have random monsters for you to kill. But the whole time you're running around with the Guardians and they're just bantering and bickering the whole time. And I enjoy stuff like that. Yeah. Some people said they, that all the chatter annoyed them. I was like, no, this is the whole point of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I agree. I think that having some people chatting helps me get more into the game. I know that's something that... I've liked about like Final Fantasy games is just like having group dynamics. So. Oh, not in sixteen though. Yeah, not as much in sixteen. I think it's sixteen could have used the, all the chatter I can remember in sixteen was get him Torgal. Yeah, I think sixteen could have used a little bit more of a yeah. Could have used a little bit more of a character uh, group. I mean, I think like as many bad things as people might have to say about like Final Fantasy fifteen, for instance. At least there was like a group. Yeah, that was fun. I Granted, I, like I think I would have liked like a girl maybe in the fifteen group. Could have helped. Could have helped some you know, diversity, but. Anywho, there's Helldivers 2. Um, oh, yeah. It's a multiplayer action shooter. I think that was like the first game that they showed. It looked very generic. Yeah, I didn't remember too much about it. It just it looked like a... Well, anyways, there's a new Foam Stars trailer ahead of next week's launch. I'd forgotten about Foam Stars since the last time they showed us a trailer <laughs> yeah. of Foam Stars. I remember, Stars. it's funny, we talked about Foam Stars when they showed it last year. We talked about it here on this podcast. Wow. During that first like state of play that we were talking about in here. <laughs> what do you think of Foam Stars? I mean, I remember back then, I think we just both agreed it felt kind of like a PlayStation Splatoon. Yes, and upon seeing it further, that still holds. I think there's a coolness factor that it goes for that I think is all right. My issue is, at least with my old eyes, it's too busy. I can't tell what's going on on screen. Oh, so visually it's kind of tough to make out? Because it's the area, at least in the trailer, It's in a, the map is actually dark. And it's the sky is dark, and then there's neon lights everywhere, and I'm like, I don't know. My guess is that that's to make the foam show up better. Like it's like com- in game it looks confusing for me. Maybe it won't look so bad or bad. Bad is subjective, but may- maybe it'll be easier on the eyes when I actually see the game itself. But yeah. um, for right now, it's not for me. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. I'm sure Sony <laughs> would prefer that you play it. How about Legendary Tales for PlayStation VR too? Oh, you mean the generic, like, uh... It's a first-person action game. gameplay that includes combat with magic swords, hammers, bows and arrows, and more in a fancy environment. I'm not gonna lie, this one looked pretty cool. Is that the one... Wait, and I think... Is this the one that looked like you said looked like, uh, Monster Hunter? No. What was that? Was that a different game? I guess it was a different that game. That was the Capcom game. Oh, okay. No, this game is essentially it's a game where your hands and you would uh you would you, you could beat up on skeletons essentially a bunch of monsters in, in dungeons and whatnot i mean it's cool or whatever but if you've been if you've been playing vr for a while you're very used to these kind of mindless beat up games where you have the power of a god or or, or something and you can like beat up mindless enemies with all kinds of weapons and spells and they barely fight back and okay like it's cool, but I've seen it before. Okay, well, it was a VR game, so it's always kind of cool to see that like stuff's being made for VR, like PlayStation VR. And so, Sony said they invent, they put money behind, it, they're gonna put some games on it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was like I remember a uh, like a survey or something that said that most VR games are like on like the or most people who play VR play on PlayStation VR. Right. And that makes sense cuz it's a, it has the largest install base. It's the mm-hmm. easiest VR thing to just buy cuz you just works with your PlayStation as opposed to like um you know having to kind of get like an Oculus and that's like a new ecosystem. Meta. A, yeah. Meta Quest. A Meta Quest, sorry. Yeah, and that's like a new ecosystem to ask people to 
And only recently did they start offering um, like first party support for Steam VR. Yeah. Before now, they expected you to hop into the uh, Meta Quest store, and that was the that was going to be your your app store. Yeah. Well, how about this new HoYoVerse game, Zenless Zone Zero? I mean, new is a stretch. We've known about Zenless Zone for quite a long time at this point. Well, today we learned that it's in development for PlayStation Five. Oh my god! So I mean, I guess more that's, appreciative. I mean, it's cool if you're a, like a HoYoVerse player. I mean, you, this what game is already. Make? They make Genshin Impact Genshin, okay. and Honkai Star Rail, and also okay. Honkai Impact Third, which is uh, which is a. a, a mobile game that was before all of this all right so tell me more about this then you're gonna be playing um i might try it i mean because these games are all they're free to play so there's no harm in trying them but it's an it's like an action it's an action rpg style of game it has this kind of a cyberpunk anime aesthetic going it's not like honkai star which is turn-based it's not but it's also not like genshin who's who has much uh simpler combat i think zenless zone is supposed to have more um like combo oriented combat so i think it might just be more engaging for people there's also dave the diver which actually uh, released last year and is just going to be coming to playstation this april so it looked like kind of more of i guess like a 2d yeah game. well not like exactly my cup of tea i will give it this it was refreshing compared to a lot of what you typically see in these like state of play things where like 2D games just don't usually make the cut because they aren't deemed as interesting or like I mean, high quality or this something. This one was for me, that was the direction I was going in until they showed Godzilla. I saw Godzilla and I said, okay, I know why you're here now. Yeah, it's like it's like a collab, I guess, with I like guess Godzilla. So. Like, it's cool. I, I, when I heard the music, I was like, oh my God, it's Godzilla. I did not expect that. V Rising. Oh, the vampire game. Yeah. The kind of a that top one, down Diablo esque playstyle. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it reminded me of Diablo, which I guess is cool. I d- but as usual, I don't care for these quiet games that have one character. Yeah. Um, there's not even really like a blurb on it that they have, at least in this article that I'm reading, but. Um, it looked neat. I mean, I think that like playing as a vampire is cool. If it plays like Diablo, which it looks loosely like it does. I could be interested in playing something like that. Yeah. I like Diablo 3. Which, for me, that makes it a hard pass, because I don't like Diablo games. Oh, you're not a fan? I don't know. that The whole top-down thing, I can't get with it. I can't do it. I don't know why. Okay, what about the vampire aesthetic? I know you like your vampire stories. I do. Still top-down. That's top not down. enough to really like, sway I don't, you. I don't know why. I remember I used to play that old game, like Gauntlet Legends, on arcade and on PlayStation 2, which is a top-down game. Yeah. But pretty much anything other than that, I... I, I just don't. I just don't care for it. Third person takes me out of it, which I guess you're literally out of it because you're looking down on all the action. All right. Well, maybe you'd be more interested in Judas. That was that, that had a really interesting trailer. That it was the one where did. the people were taking the weird selfies and like it's like they're listening to everything that you say. Yeah. I don't know what was going on in the gameplay. Yeah, it's the next game from Ken Levine, the creator of Bioshock, and it definitely resembles his original work. It looks like a colorful dystopian game with first person combat. It said fix what you broke or something, save what you something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. So uh, my assumption is the uh, the girl you see who's like sp- doing she's doing something that's supposed to break the system and free everyone despite wh- wh- whatever they want. And then it just now you're just fighting and I'm assuming she has to save the world. By fighting all these strange things, that's certainly a, an aesthetic that I think uh, people will enjoy. I won't, so I won't be playing it, but I know that other people will like it. Interesting. Well, there are other games. We got Sonic X Shadow Generations. This one uh, I was really excited about. I'm a huge Sonic fan, so I know there had been like some rumors that we would be getting a Sonic Generations remaster of some kind, kind of similar mm-hmm. to Sonic Colors Ultimate um, that came out a couple years back. But I think this is really exciting because Sonic Generations is one of the better received Sonic games of the last, you know, couple decades, really. I became interested when they showed Shadow. Yeah, and Shadow's in it this time. I love the way that he interrupted the trailer. I thought that was... It was because they were literally using the same identical trailer from Sonic Generations, like, mm-hmm. you know, 15 years back almost now. And then, like, Shadow just shows up and, like, kind of jumps between them and then they make, like, the pose from Sonic Adventure 2 where, like, they're crossing and 
it's cool. So it seems like we're going to have like a lot of the same levels from the original game. And there are also new levels where Shadow takes kind of takes the lead. And it seems like he's fighting against like the black arms from the game Shadow the Hedgehog, like back in like 2005. Or I wonder whatever. if that'll be a retelling, if they'll be like just kind of retelling the events of that game, given that it's, it's, we've been far removed from Shadow the Hedgehog, or if it's going to be like a new story. I think that they're going to just retread some ground and like maybe it's like some of Shadow's history as well as Sonic's history. I also hope for more things from the game like I'd like to see more levels because Sonic mm. Sonic Generations is a very fun game but it's a very short game mm. and for a game that's supposed to sort of celebrate a lot of Sonic's history it's a shame then that it and only really had more like of it. nine levels and I think like that could literally be like doubled by today's standards especially if it's like not like they're having to really develop a new game they're going to probably be using the same engine and like that sort of stuff the graphics and stuff are mostly done so I would love to see more about that. They announced that it's just going to be coming out this autumn, which is coming right. sooner, to be completely Stay honest. Stay tuned. But yeah, it's going to be on all platforms, like PC and Xbox and stuff. It was cool they decided to put it at the state of play. Okay, there's a little bit more to get what through. What else you got? There's, um, so I already talked about Judas. There's Silent Hill, that new Silent Hill game. Um, the, Ko- uh, the Kojima game. What did you think of that? They, That's about Silent Hill, right? I think so. That's what it's I called. don't like Silent Hill. And I'll tell you why. Yeah. I don't like horror games. I just don't. That's an entire genre that you can just miss me is with. Is that Kojima? Am I thinking of is that something else? Silent Hill. That's not Kojima, right? I mean, Death That's Strand- just Konami. You're thinking of Death Stranding. Yeah, I think of Death Stranding. Yeah, but yeah, okay, let's Konami talk about Silent, Silent Hill. Hill. That's a Konami. Okay. Yeah. A free um, to play Silent Hill spinoff that will be available to play later today. Yeah, the game looked intense. I'm good. Yeah, it was a little terrifying. Yeah, the girl uh, looks like she's about to commit suicide and ends up in this even more terrifying world than the one she came from. I think it would be a fun game to like stream since it's probably like an hour or two long. I'm sure that's what the streamers are doing right now. Yeah, um, that'd be fun. Like, especially if it was like a Halloween stream, like kind of thing spooky. I didn't expect uh, so much horror uh, in January. That was that was strange for me. Yeah, I'm not super into the horror games. Speaking of horror games, Until Dawn Remaster coming to ps5 and pc didn't play until dawn the fr- i didn't play the first one so yeah i uh also did not play so i can't remark too much on it but for those excited about it that's certainly pretty cool I know a lot of people like these scary games they're just not not for you no. why, why don't you like them i don't like being scared i don't like being anxious i don't like being worried i, I don't i just <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm always surprised at how well the video games can sell that. Like, looking at it from a distance, I'm always like, oh, man, like, a video game couldn't, like, scare you. Like, it's a video game. But I've played a couple of them, and they can be pretty terrifying. The ambiance and, like, jump again. scares. I, I don't like jump scares. I don't like uh, uh, ambient music. I don't like, like, scary-looking I, monsters. What was that game that we played on, like, the Wii U? Where you, the girl with the camera. Don't you bring that back what to me. What was that? That, that was, called? um... Fatal Frame. Fatal Frame, yeah, that yeah. was a little creepy. Didn't like Fatal Frame either. I think I tried to play Until Dawn, but I just didn't, I don't remember. Maybe that wasn't even, uh, some horror game. Like, the closest I've ever gotten to playing a horror game is um, Dying Light, which isn't horror, not really. What is Dying Light? It's a zombie survival game. Oh, okay. So but, you're, but you're like a parkour master, and so oh. it's really um, like a sandbox where you just... Kind of action Kill survival zombies. stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, what about um, Team Ninja's Rise of the Ronin? This one seemed like they kind of caught oh, your eye. Yeah, this one actually was interesting. It's hard. It's hard to place that one in a box exactly, but it's it's a lot of one on one sword combat. I, yeah, like. I saw a lot of different games in it, which was kind of cool. You had the uh, movement and traversal systems that kind of reminded me of something like Spider Man. Or Assassin's Creed, but then I saw the I saw this kind of this the combat system reminded me of like a Soul style game, and but it was way more dynamic than a typical Soul style game. But then there was also a pretty involved story with lots of different characters, and I I was I was in, I was like okay I might try this one out. Yeah, that one looks pretty neat. I like the time period, mm, uh, yeah, the so Bakamatsu of- era. Yeah, those period piece games seem cool. And I think the final game, of course, is the Hideo Kojima game, um, Death Stranding 2 on the beach. On the beach. So this is like a 9, 10 minute long, like kind of 
trailer and this gameplay was, thing. This was the climax of the... Uh, I feel like this was like the reason they made the state of play. Yeah. It, and it's, they just shoved some other games. For Death Stranding. It's for Kojima. Yeah, shoved a few other games on top just to like, you know, an undercard. Um, well, what'd you think of it? Of this game specifically? Yeah. It looked, it looked, it looked great. Okay. It, it, look, it looks really good. Um, lots of cool aesthetics in the, um, the trailer itself. Um... I always like to see Norman Reedus. I was a, I really enjoyed the first few seasons of The Walking Dead, so that was cool. No, that's who that is. Okay. Um, I liked the uh, the dude who had the guitar axe. That was a really cool. That was a really cool thing to see. I'm I'm, I'm a sucker for things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, but I won't be playing it. Oh, why not? I think it's too weird. Uh, that's my same feelings with Death Stranding one, the original. Weird in like what way? So the Death Stranding series just. I don't know what goes on in Kojima's mind, but he just some he just thinks of some off the wall things to add to his games. A of fucked up that shit. just, but they're not messed up. They're just strange. Uh, okay. Like I, I I didn't play Death Stranding. I watched my older brother play it. So that's the best I can give you. But I I didn't understand why the girl at the beginning had a had the gloves. I like the gloves they, that are like weird. They like gestured and everything. And, yeah. and then there was the puppet man who just randomly he he at a lower frame rate who could talk and move he's like around. A, he's like a cartoon thing. It feels like, like it's like a. There's the baby thing, which I never understood in the first place. It feels like a bit of a trip. Like a like a like a drug trip, and like it just these ideas came to him. It feels like it is the like it's the masterwork of some of a creative, in that. So I understand that Death Stranding is pro, is pro, is is really cool conceptually. I don't want to be in Kojima's head. I don't want to be stuck in that world. It seems a little. It up. weirds me out. I I can't I can't do it. <laughs> well, that's the state of play. Would you? I think overall, I'm going to say that for me, uh, it was a bit short, it felt like. You I said mean, it was mid? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. But um, I think that it, it, it didn't show as many games as I would have expected. Oh, so very mid. Woo. Yeah. Oh. Well, you, what did you think? I thought it was peak. I don't know. Like, if, you know, in this world, there things can only be mid or peak. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, uh, I mean, I thought it was fine. Um I thought it could use some more games, but that I feel could like the just other be. Other one we watched had more. I think I feel like it did too. This is coming from somebody who like I mean I don't I don't play that many games. You guys know this. So like for me, it's more interesting to see a lot of games than it is mm-hmm. to see a few. So even though like literally I will not be playing anything on this entire list except for Sonic, but like I still would like to believe that I could potentially be interested and converted to playing one of them. And I think that I believe that more when there's an event that has like. 20 games compared to like eight or 10 or whatever. I wasn't wild by this event, but I feel like it's unfair to rate it because if we switch out any one of these games with like a JRPG, I'd have been saying, wow, this was an amazing showcase. I think that's why you got to go for more though. Cause I don't, cause I'm not going to say this was like a bad state of play or a mm-hmm. good state of play. Like I'm, you know, like, like you said, on the internet, things can only be like one of two things, terrible, amazing. Yeah. But I don't think it's that it's terrible or amazing because it didn't speak to me, and I think it could have spoken to more people by just including more games. I it felt my this is and this is a theory, so take it with a grain of salt. I'm not make I'm not saying I know this for a fact, but it felt like they didn't have as many games prepared, but the date was already locked in. Yeah, and they gave Death Stranding the extra long trailer to fill up to the fill space kind of where 40, other games would have yep. been. Yep, I I got the same vibe. Uh, I mean, I think it's probably, it's probably they probably could have waited until like another month or two. Maybe some developers would have a little bit more to show. What was interesting too is at the end they announced that like next week they're going to be doing another one that's specifically based on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which was so my f- that's kind of odd. <laughs> my first thought was like I, I really don't want to see any more Rebirth because uh, I mean for people like me, we know we're already going to get it, so I don't know. You don't have to show me anything. I'm, I'm going to buy it one way or another. But sure, there's a lot of people who love to see all these reveals before a game releases. But I thought it was strange to do that because when I went to check like Twitter discourse afterwards, I just wanted to get a pulse of what people were thinking and saying. I saw more posts about Final Fantasy Rebirth getting its own a kind of a state of play than I saw anyone talking about um, 
what was it? Hell people too, or or, whatever, yeah. or, or um, dragons. These remind me a dogma. lot of how like Nintendo Directs kind of tend to be, where people will have one or two games they really want to hear about, mm-hmm. and if a direct or a state of play, or what does the Xbox call them? The Xbox like game showcase, like. If it does not show like those one of those like big games, it's garbage like, for a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, that and, actually reminds me of a tweet I saw. Okay. It said, "Wow, wow, dog shit show PlayStation, your move Xbox." <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it like fun that there's just still people like <laughs> I, I I know I I genuinely say this with like full like awareness of what it's like to be kind of in this position but i'm just i'm not anymore is like being as invested in the console wars i think as people are yeah. like it's, it's so bizarre to me <laughs> like i don't know if it's because like i guess i just don't play that many games these days so like i like i don't know <laughs> playstation 5 or an xbox but like i just it's like when you see people who are like wow like Sony failed this one, like your move, Xbox, or like you know these people, or, or like vice versa, where people are like, Xbox is dying, and more like, like Xbox, yeah, like no. you know whatever, like Sony's like winning the console war, and I'm just like, is there like really a? I mean, I mean, yeah, they're competing for market share, but I feel like at this point, that ship has sailed. I mean, yeah, I feel like, like the console wars to me like died with like. PS3 360 kind of era. Like, that was the last time I remember, I guess, personally feeling invested in, like, what console was selling better, or which console was like, getting the most games. Because we live and in I was, a like, post-pandemic in, world now. Like, and I was, like, in high school or something. It's, I don't it, know. It's real different right now. I remember during the pandemic, people were just trying to get their hands on a PlayStation 5. Like, yeah, if I, they I guess could it get gives one. people things to argue about and, like, feel like, you know, your side won. But I don't know, like, if I can really get into the idea of, like, being on a side of a like billion dollar corporation or whatever that could not care less really about me and just want my dollar. Like they're not going to fight for you. I feel like you just play whatever console you're familiar with and you, and that's it. That's like, that's the, or you play like what your friends are on. Or your friends all have have both. Well, I feel like there are some people who fall in the friend groups where it's like, Oh, okay. A lot of my friends have an Xbox or a lot of my friends Mm. have a PlayStation. So if you're in the position of buying one or the other, you just get whatever more people are playing. Yeah. Fair. Or something. Or if you're like someone like me, like, Maybe you just get one for the one game series you like, the one or two, you know? That's true. I feel like you would just have a PlayStation to, like, catch... You catch maybe the Final Fantasies. And that's like, it. I don't, I don't know. Is there anything on Xbox that you, like, that you care Not about? Not for me. But, yeah. I mean, there are some people who, like, they really like Halo. Get your play, get your Xbox or whatever. You really Who like... likes Halo? Stop that. Yeah. Le- learn to love yourself. I mean... I don't know. So. Now, like, Halo, Halo was actually my first online game, like, ever. It, yeah. We 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 boot we boot like a bunch of uh, demo copies and spread them on our school's computers. Yeah. So why do you say it's bad now? You think it's oh, because I hated the last Halo. I don't know which one that was. It's like whatever it was called. I, I got it off the Microsoft was store. It, was it the one where like it it came incomplete? Yeah, like it didn't have like a multiplayer mm-hmm. mode or something. Or it didn't have some modes. Hey, I was so upset. Okay. I was really mad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that too. Um. Yeah, so, I don't know, console wars are always very, like, it's just, they're bizarre. They give me a headache. But, but anywho, yeah, so that's the oh, PlayStation. my tablet turned off. Okay, well, that's the <laughs> PlayStation state of play. Um, you know, I, was it good or bad? I won't say, but I'll just say that I would have liked to see a little more. Yeah, and if, and if, if your favorite game got announced or got a trailer, hey, kudos to you. Yeah, I would love to hear what other people are looking forward to from the trailer. I think if I had to give it... A game I'm most interested in, it would be Sonic. And if I had to give it a game that I didn't know I would already like, then I think that the Stella Blade, oh, Stellar, Stellar Blade, Blade yeah. seemed like it, it. It's pretty unique. Yeah, the, that it was that in the Ronin game that caught my eyes. The Ronin game was also really cool. Okay, well, listen, we got a little Marvel news. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't. I can't <laughs> have any more news. Yeah, it's you know, it wouldn't be a pot of greed without a quick bit of Marvel news. MCU. So, MCU. um, X Men First Class director Matthew Vaughn says Deadpool 3's Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman quote are about to save the whole Marvel universe. Oh, jeez. So, um, yeah, basically. The few snippets that I know about Deadpool versus Wolverine 
Um, I'm sure that argument between Ryan and Hugh is happening as we speak, whether it's Deadpool versus Wolverine or Wolverine versus Deadpool, whatever, are unbelievable, he says. That's going to be the jolt. The jolt, the Marvel Universe is about to have a jolt of them, and it's going to bring that body back to life. I think Ryan and Hugh are about to save the whole Marvel Universe. Um, so, as you guys know, Deadpool 3 coming out on July 26th. I know it recently wrapped filming somewhat recently. I remember seeing like some posts about that. And it sounds like people are kind of expecting this to maybe be the thing that like turns stuff around for Marvel in the public discourse. What are your thoughts? Okay, first I want to say, uh, you know, I like Deadpool. Deadpool's really cool. Um, I like Deadpool too. before most people even knew who he was. So, you know, I'm, I'm not like a fair weather fan or anything like that. I am. Um, That's the best I can always <laughs> say about myself. You know, Wolverine's cool. X-Men are cool. I like, I like Wolverine a lot. Uh, you know, I'm watching the 90s cartoon. I'm a, I'm a Wolverine fan. Uh, however, let's say this is uh, like this actually comes to pass that Deadpool three saves the, the MCU. MCU, right? Yeah. Um. So do should the, the savior of the MCU that will bridge us to the future is two men who've already made many movies and are probably close to retirement. Yeah, I mean, I think that they probably say this just because, at least going into what I know, like, going into this movie, is that people like Deadpool, and I feel like Deadpool kind of, it stands in a place that's similar to Guardians of the Galaxy, mm -hmm. where it feels fairly detached from the MCU, and its popularity is more from itself, and not just, like, being another MCU hero. Well, I mean, it is completely detached. Yeah. Up until now, It was Marvel, a Sony thing, wasn't it? Yeah, Marvel has, been, yeah. Marvel has nothing to do with Deadpool. Only with Deadpool 3 are they getting involved. Yeah, but so... In a I weird mean, way, I hope it doesn't save Marvel just because we're going to, you know, Hugh Jackman had already retired once. Yeah, I mean, maybe by save Marvel, they just mean it will be so good that people just generally like Marvel movies again. And it's not so much that it's like they're going to become the new Avengers and be in every single thing, but more like, hey, it'll finally be like a big hit. Marvel in a time where they kind of could use it. Then they could use a hit, but then the question is, what comes next? Do we make a Deadpool 5? Yeah, not does, sure. Does Ryan Reynolds have a Deadpool 7 in him? Well, as... Oh, Lord. As the article points out, um, you know, it seems like between, like, Jonathan Majors being, you know, I guess, presumably dropped, Marvel's cut ties with him, so we're not sure, like, what's going to happen with that story yeah, that is unfortunate or fortunate depending on what side of fence you and also on. the marvels became the lowest grossing mcu movie of all time finishing its theatrical what run a shame um with a box office grossing of around 205 million dollars which puts it roughly on par with dc's bird of prey which was considered a bomb despite ma making back more than twice its budget that's pretty sad actually this yeah. that last little comparison because like it did as bad as DC's Bird of Prey, which is a complete flop for a Marvel movie. But for DC's Bird of Prey, that was like... That was very successful. That was fairly successful, I guess, by their and I standards. didn't even like Birds of Prey. Yeah. Not one um, bit. Although that, that was still, I guess, considered a bomb. So It's... I mean, because we're always going to compare DC to Marvel. So even though DC's standards of success should be lower, they're going to get Marvel's standards of success. And... Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, like, I will go and see this movie. I think this is the only MCU movie coming out this year, is my understanding. Good. Which, yeah, I'm not saying that's, like, a good or a bad thing. I mean, I, for one, don't mind, like, having multiple MCU films in a given year. I just think that, like, two is probably as much as I'm willing to. I think given the current trajectory of the MCU, they need to slow down and reconfigure. Okay. Yeah, well... Maybe this will save it, as they say. It sounds I mean, exciting. It could. It's one of those things where the formula should be fine, right? Hugh Jackman's Wolverine tests well across the board. Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool tests well across the board. So it seems like, like there should it be. should. It's you know it's too good to fail. It can't go wrong, right? Well, what do you think? I mean, I think it'll be fine. I think people will enjoy it. Will I it mean, save the MCU? You no. Figure? Can anything save the MCU? No. Does the MCU need saving? The MCU needs to take a hard look in the mirror, and I guess that's what they've been doing lately, and get back to what actually made their movies enjoyable. 
I always love that like remark about the MCU because I feel like everyone sort of says it, and it just what exactly it is is so hard to capture. Oh, I can capture it. So yeah, like what do you? You, think? Got, you have to drop this whole interconnected w- stories and groundbreak of groundbreaking proportions. Like we yeah we had Endgame. You did you did good. All right. Mm-hmm. However, we only got to Endgame because of Iron Man one. We only got there because of Captain America. It was a slow build up to that point. Yeah. And the MCU seemingly just wanted to charge into the very next big thing they could get. Yeah. And people clearly weren't into it. But they start they just kept releasing things anyway. Like Yeah. I think that uh, one thing I'll say about the Deadpool movie that seems pretty cool to me is that it's like a kind of team up slash. I mean, it, I guess they're going to be opposed for some of the movie and then probably friends by the end of it. That's or whatever just Marvel kind of tropes. Like, well, the thing is, I like that actually because I think that like team up movies are pretty fun. Mm-hmm. I think that when it, what I don't really care too much for is like the, like everything is all tied together in this huge multiversal like world ending story stuff. I'm not really, like, all that into that. I, I like the idea of just maybe, like, you know, you watch a Daredevil show and perhaps for one episode he teams up with, like, a person you know. That's, like, fine. I just, I don't love when it's, like, post credit scene that implies that, like, these three movies are connected and, like, all the, the Marvel homework and well, the, sadly, everything's leading up to everything. Sadly, that's what most people are looking forward to. They want to see how this connects to the MCU. They want, they want Deadpool in the MCU. They want Wolverine in the MCU. They... they most people seemingly only care about how this relates to the MCU, and I liked Deadpool when it was not when a it part felt of it. decoupled from yeah, it. Yeah, that. Okay, this is gonna sound like a really newbie question, and you can answer it for me. So, like, what Wolverine is this? That's a great question, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> but mean um, that, like, I, I don't know that much about the, like Wolverine, and like, is it is this the same one from? So, I mean, what was what was that movie that I watched? Hold up. Was it Logan? Logan, yeah. Is this the same one from Logan? It kind of can't be. I mean, may, no. Because he it, died it kinda in that, can't right? Be. It, it can't be. But he was be. played by the same actor, right? Yes. Okay. I know. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, okay. It doesn't make any sense. Cool. But that's the kind of franchise Deadpool is. And I feel like Hugh Jackman was actually going to be in Deadpool 3 with or without this whole MCU deal thing. Okay. So I don't. So I don't think you have to worry about whether or not he connects to the original X Men continuity. Like, but so is this this? Oh, sorry, Finn. No, because like, he is the same actor from okay. all those old older X Men movies, and so you might you might want to say, oh, well, maybe it's all connected. But it's just, it's just he happens to be the same actor. Yeah, it just happens to be the same actor. I mean, Deadpool has never been in an X Men movie. And, and now I've heard that they're trying to incorporate the X Men into the MCU. Yes, they, I mean, they seemingly are. Yes, because okay, it's one yeah. of those things that are. It's kind of seen as one of those adrenaline boosts that could probably give the MCU. Okay. The X Men is a household name, like at, to the same magnitude as Captain America and Iron Man. Yeah, they had a good run the first time around, but um, with what was that Fox? Yeah, but you know some of the movies kind of eh, they didn't they didn't land perfectly well. There was a lot of legal mumbo mumbo jumbo, but with some of the sneak pre sneak peeks we got with the Marvels and whatnot. And with Multiverse of Madness, we can be fairly certain, all right, the X-Men are going to show up. We just don't know when. Um, do I, am I happy about that? I mean, as much as any other Marvel fan is, it just, put, for God's sake, MCU, take it slow. Okay. Well, cool. I'll be looking forward to watching a little bit of Deadpool 3 and saving the MCU with my ticket purchase <laughs> this July. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll see. I don't. I, I think I only saw one Deadpool movie. I don't remember which one I saw. I saw one or two, but I don't think I saw both. So <laughs> I like them both. I like them both. The Deadpool movies are funny. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the stories I've got for today. I had more, but um, oh, did you? Oh, tablet's dead. Well, okay. That's all right. We can reach into the pot and get some more stories from the viewers. <laughs> yeah, guys, tell us a story. Remember, you can actually. Go into our Google form. It's in the description to add your own questions so you, too, can be included in the pod of greed. Yeah, that's right. I do always love answering a viewer question or two. I think we've got some really good ones as of late, like some really juicy discussion points. That I think some people really just like being a part of the conversation. Yeah, and we like for you to be a part of the conversation. It's like an extra story in and of itself, really. 
Okay, Ooh, this is a long one. So many times in the last round of a tourney, I get anxiety and make poor decisions. Any advice to overcome this? Hmm. Oh, I can't yeah, I help remember. you have horrible success in tournaments. <laughs> well, I remember writing this question. Yeah, this is a person who was, I think, reflecting on the fact that, like, whenever they were maybe in the last round of, like, a case tournament or, like, a win a, like a, win a mat tournament, whatever, at locals or, like, a regional or whatever, they would kind of get, like, cold feet or anxiety kind of in their last round and, I guess, flub it. Um, relatable, first of all. I think definitely relatable. I mean, I, I've, I've been there. My, so as somebody who has been kind of at, like, the maybe top table or something at like a regional or a shop OTS. Obviously not like from a veteran, y'all. Not 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 an OICS. I'm not like that. Good. <laughs> but you know, someone who's like I've won local tournaments before, of course. But like, yeah, I think that the best thing that I could probably say, uh, I just kind of I know this is easier said than done. I kind of just view all my Yu Gi Oh rounds as like just like another match. Like I don't. Mm-hmm. I've never really found myself to be like a person who gets very worried about who I'm facing or like, I mean, I guess like there's like obviously like a mashup maybe that you don't like, but I guess I just view it as like, there's nothing any more special about this round than like any other round. Um, That might not actually be true. Like obviously the person that you're probably playing in the finals is very good. Whereas like the person maybe in round one, not so much. But I think that that mindset just allows me to not feel any more stressed about the situation right. than I would um, any other time. I mean, so. I've had, I, I, I always forget that uh, while I don't compete well in Yu-Gi-Oh! at all, I have competed in Digimon. And while I haven't won any major events, I've won a few, I've won a few store championships. And I, my favorite thing is I've gone to other people's shops and won their locals, which is uh, some when I travel that around. Feel nice. Yeah, I, I'll you know, I'll travel around. I'll be looking on a little the Bandai TCG app, looking for shops. And a few times I've just shown up to, to people's locals and I, I've won it. And the thing is, I'm typically one of those people who uh, anxiety kind of like destroys me during like tournaments. We used to play. We used to have like we used to have a Smash scene. Uh, what was that Smash Four? Yeah, we used to have a Smash Four scene, and I would practice and practice and practice. I was in no way a complete noob at the game, but I could not win sets. I got anxious. I couldn't stand people watching my games. I got more into. I would look at the reflections in TV in the TV screen and see who's behind me while the match is going, which means you know I probably yeah, lost. Yeah, really focusing. If you're making eye contact with someone behind you, you're not gonna win. So. All I can say is because that, that didn't affect me on my like my winning tournaments in the Digimon community, and all I can really say is I just kind of focused on the cards. I did. It was usually I like to be very animated and like talk to my opponents a lot when I play. But when I think about it in tournament, I kind of just focus on the cards. I look at my cards, look at their cards, and yeah, I I just don't let other things enter my mind. Yeah, I'm not a very uh, animated player ever. Mm. I'm actually pretty much the opposite. Like, I'm very, uh, not in, like, a rude way. I don't. I try not to be, like, rude to my opponents, but, like, I know a lot of people kind of, they enjoy, like, you know, a lot of laughter, a lot of socializing and joking Sometimes I play. crack a joke to lure them into a false sense of security. Yeah, like, I never really do that. But I think that also can sometimes work to my advantage because, like, I think I'm, or I've been told I'm a bit of a harder player to read for that reason. It's mm-hmm. harder to, like, kind of tell. But I don't know. I, I know it's easier said than done, but I really just try not to take, like, matches very seriously right and i think maybe a more tangible thing that could help with that though is if you've like practiced enough like if you've just done enough play testing i don't think that there's there should ever be like a matchup that you don't feel like you have something of a game plan in and you right. feel like generally speaking before i go to say a regional or like a, maybe an ots sort of championship thing i like test very heavily in the week leading up to it and not even like against i mean sometimes i'll test with people i know other times it'll just be online like i used to just Hop on EDO Pro to, yeah, I used to just run EDO Pro for but hours. But the thing is, I do that so that, like, there's nothing that's, like, overtly surprising to me. Mm-hmm. Like, somebody might, like, take me off guard with a very specific tech card or something, right? But, like, there's not just, like, a, a certain deck where I'm like, oh, I have no clue what I'm going to do against this. I usually kind of know. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, 
losing one doesn't mean you lose the rest of them and all that stuff. I know that's like kind right. of typical cheesy, like, eh, it'll be okay. Like, it's, But you know, it's, it's the last best. round. You're at the top table. But this is the of, only one that matters. But a really nice thing to remember, though, is that if you're like at the top tables at your locals or your regionals or whatever, you know, you're pretty damn good at this game, huh? Right? Like, I, I think that that alone can kind of get you through. It's like, you're not here by accident. Especially if, based on this comment, it sounds like it's something that happens... It's, like, happened multiple times. Like, I get cold feet every time this happens. But if you think about it, then that means, like, man, you've been at the top a lot. So maybe you deserve to be there. And there's not really anything to worry about. This this win could just as easily be yours as it is the person across from you. As long as you're making competitive, you're not so nervous that, like, you're literally not playing your cards properly. Yeah, always just kind of remember what you practice. Stick to the game plan. Um, and, like, focus on the cards. Just yeah. The cards, the, cards the cards don't change. Don't change. Yeah, yeah each round, ra- the rounds may get more like tense, but the cards are always the same. Same combos, same hand traps. Yeah. Well, here's mine. Okay, this is an interesting one. I also remember reading my question. Um, somebody was asking about like kind of the idea of betting on TCG exclusive archetypes, like whether or not they'll be good. Oh, okay. Um, what do you think of TCG exclusive archetypes um, and the way that they kind of tend to be consistently bad or underwhelming, almost maybe despite the fact that Konami will like push them like gold pride accessories, like the sleeves and stuff mm-hmm. that they'll release. You know, the TCG exclusives kind of have this rep of just not being good. And like Ashen so far, at least, does not look like it's going to be a particularly it, it standout. It does not seem amazing. to be winning any awards. That's true. How do you feel about like that? Just the fact that TCG exclusive archetypes have almost always been not great. What about War Cosmo? Rock. Well, I mean, but like since then, it feels like there hasn't been a lot. Burning Abyss was good. Yeah. Cosmo ended up being pretty good, although it got quickly kind of cut off with the neck by Pepe. I mean, yeah. And I mean, since the, then, the there, game haven't, there have not been <laughs> TCG exclusive archetypes that have really like made a dent. Is that a, is that a problem? Well, for this person, it seems like it is. Because that, that's actually my point is... Is it really a problem that the TCG exclusive archetypes aren't competitive? There was no promise that they would be. The promise was that they'd have a cool, unique design, and they almost always do. That's what they're promising you. They're not promising you competitive success. Now, if you want to buy into the hype and spend all that money on these cards, I mean, that's as far as betting on Yu-Gi-Oh!, you're making a bad bet. Every yeah. other archetype is released in Japan ahead of time. We get a good idea of how they'll perform here. And sometimes, they, even still, they don't do it. But we don't know what these cards are going to look like. I don't think you should just bet on TCG exclusives being good. Hmm, yeah, I've got a few thoughts. So, I mean, I think that it is unfortunate that in Yu-Gi-Oh! today, and this goes for a lot of games, so it's not a Yu-Gi-Oh! exclusive thing, but Yu-Gi-Oh! is a pretty mature game. And so mm-hmm. for a lot of new archetypes, when they come out it does sort of feel as though, like, if something isn't good, it isn't worth anything at all. And I, I don't like that. Like, I don't like that they're, like, archetypes can come out and it's like, archetype, bad, trash. Like, it's not worth playing. Like, it's not worth your attention. It's not worth anything in the eyes of a lot of players. And I think that there's there's something to be said for just playing a deck because you like it. And even if it's not, like, the best thing, that should still be okay. Um, something else I was going to say, too, is that, like, I have a hunch, maybe it's like a tinfoil hat theory, but like a bit of a hunch about TCG exclusive archetypes. What's that? Uh, my hunch is that I think that TCG exclusive archetypes are kind of Konami, you know, because they're usually designed not by like the Japanese team, yeah. I think is my understanding of it. It's examples or snippets of how Konami kind of maybe wishes this game was played. Does that hmm. sound crazy to you? It does feel like a lot of our uh, TCG exclusives play in a they play really well in a format we're not in. Yeah, they they feel like they're always kind of designed typically like as mid-range or like something. And they also cool. typically are just at a more middle power level. Because like Gold Pride is a pretty solid deck, you know, not in not in the TCG. Yeah, like it's not like a regional winning thing per se, but like... It's you could have fun with a gold pride deck, like you really could, and you could still like win if you were maybe playing in a lower power format. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I think, like with the TCG exclusives, they're an example of what maybe if Konami in A was in charge of all this balancing and card design, we might have a game where the power level is simply a little bit like this is down here, right? 
compared to um, up here. Because instead of focusing on the abject power of these archetypes, Konami seems to choose to focus on interesting mechanics that other archetypes don't take advantage of. And it seems more about interesting gameplay. Yeah, Just, I mean, I look at some highlights. Like, not all DG exclusive archetypes have managed to be, like, super unique. But, like, Plunder Patrol was a really cool one. I remember it's that my, was... It's my favorite. That was a fun time. Um, I think, obviously, Cosmos were very unique. Love Cosmos and um, death. But even recently, Gold Pride, fairly unique, for sure. The whole mm-hmm. extra deck, they were turning the extra deck in the end phase and that whole thing. Uh, Tistina flipped stuff up and down. I did not like that. Or something like that. Did I don't. Not I did like not read too much into them. They did not end up making a huge impact. My main problem with them was not the mechanic, but actually just how they looked. Yeah. They, they were, like, not... They were like kind of just these crystal, crystal creatures, things. and it didn't seem a little bit too nondescript. We've for me. seen we've seen and we've seen enough shiny monsters. We got plenty. I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't have like a strong opinion on them being good or bad. I just think that they are. Uh, they are what they are. It, but since that's a cop out answer, here's the best thing I can say to respond to the prompt itself. Um, buy it because you like it, not because you think it'll be good. So whether whatever investing means to you, if that's buying mm-hmm. a lot of packs or buying the singles. Buy it because you like it, not just because you think it'll be good. And also, um, on Konami's end, I think if they want to make these lower power archetypes that are more middling level, then it's really their responsibility to give those decks a place where they can be used. Because otherwise, if you're going to sit here and release Tistina, and seemingly, right now, Ashen not looking the best then, like, you got to give us maybe a format where those decks can thrive a little bit. And, you know, I'm always going to be a little mad that Plunder Patrol don't, they never get to be tier one. Yeah, because, they, and that's, it's like, there's not, like, a place where that stuff can be played. It, it does seem to me, like, if my theory checks out, TG exclusive archetypes are mid-level on purpose. Mm-hmm. They they look kind of like how a, a maybe ideal version of Yu-Gi-Oh! from someone's eyes looks. It's just that maybe can we get that format where... Ashen is supposed to be viable, or Gold Pride supposed to be like viable, or it's entirely possible that they're not allowed to make them too strong. Could be that too. I mean, Japan makes the the like ninety percent of all cards come out of Japan. They ultimately decide the power level of these cards, and I don't know if they would love the TCG making cards quote unquote better than theirs. Yeah, I mean, like there's sometimes where like the TCG exclusive stuff has made a huge impact, like Kaiju. Yeah, they they weren't like the archetype was not seen as good, but like the cards the made cards a splash. themselves were just gigantic. Dangers, that's another Dangerous. one. So you know, there's times where it makes a big splash, but I, I think making these like more underwhelming archetypes is disappointing because it prompts questions like this, where it's like, okay, I'm tired of buying into them and then not being good. When maybe what Konami needs to do then is like create a place where a player can feasibly use TCG them. exclusive format. Would be the worst thing in the world. Hmm, anyway, next question. That. Oh, yeah. I suppose. I mean, unless you, I don't know if you had more to no, I'm good. say on Let's, it. Let me dig. There you go. All right. What is this? What are your opinions on Yu Gi Oh card lore? Huh? Just, just in general? Just in general. What is, what is my opinion on lore? Um, it's something that's not widely. Like, it's really not looked at all that much in the Yu-Gi-Oh! space. And that's both on, like, us as um, players, but mostly on Konami. They keep making these cards. They create, like, faux stories that are told through, like, artwork and sometimes flavor text. And then we do nothing with that. Uh, Agreed, yeah. So, I think I have a few... Just kind of off the top of my dome thoughts on lore mm-hmm. I've said for many times. A, the fact that we don't get those like lore books that they get in the OCG, like they'll release oh, what, what yeah. are they called? Oh, the, I forgot the name. The Master Guide or just Master something like Guides. that. They'll release them every couple of years and it kind of just fills in some of the lore of the different archetypes that have released over the last few years. We gotta wait on translations. Um, and we just sometimes will get people who roughly translate them. It's insane to me that Konami does not like release that at least. You ought to even release it in stores. Make a Freaking PDF on the website. People just download that. I don't know. They seem like so averse to it, or maybe they're not allowed to do it. But I think that would help because it would let people get more invested in the archetypes, Mm -hmm. um, kind of visually and what's going on. Second thing, uh, make like 
short animated bits or something. Short animated bits. Hey, let's get get an author to write a book, like a yeah, short like book. Yeah, like write an Albaz or Visus like book, or like now we've got you know Die Bell Star story a manga. going on. Yeah, have a little short manga or like a. I felt like I mean Magic the Gathering does like a, a trailer for new sets that yeah. like kind of showcases story wise and stuff like what's going on in the set. In fact, they actually um, they tell the entire story of their sets on like their website. You can. Find out what's happening in the mur- at, with the murders at Karlov Manor. Like, it's so strange to me too that like these stories can be happening, but there's kind of a point at which it just like you can't do any more with your interest in it. So yeah. it's like let's say that I really like you know Visa Starfrost and just kind of his story or whatever, and like he's on a lot of cards and stuff kind of happens. But, like, outside of, I guess, just building the decks and inferring what's going on from the card art, there's nothing else for me there. Like, I can't really buy much in the way of Visus merch, and I can't get a more consistent, like, a, just a... I want the story told to me, not just, like, through looking at, I don't know, Kashtira Theosis and just kind of inferring, oh, this must be what's happening here. Okay, great. Like, they'll also make, like, a, a thing that tells me it. So um, I can like the story. I don't more. know why Konami thinks that such a thing isn't like worth it. Why they think that wouldn't make any money or drive interest. But I mean, every other car game does it. I, I, I think you know. can do it in, in lightweight ways that don't involve a lot of like, like cost. Like you know, like so social media is a thing. I know they they'll occasionally share like those concept arts for monsters. Like That's yeah, we'll much. get those, uh, and the, the, all they are are just little annotations, like next to the drawings. Like, oh, I can we can learn this about Dia Bellstar, but it's so frighteningly little, and you just they just leave they leave so much on the table because they yeah. have to make so many new cards every set. They tell so many stories through these card artworks, and then they just don't even they just don't use them. Yeah, it, it always feels like a bit of like wasted effort because like. The stories have literally gotten better and better lately. Yeah. Like, World Legacy was a very good story. Alabaster was a very good story. Visus, I don't know. It's not it. finished. Yeah, I don't. I think that might be still, still going on, huh? Well, it's weird. We, we haven't gotten a new Visus card in a while, but as far as I can tell from the artwork, that story didn't end. And then, like, Diabell Star is starting, and it kind of feels like these are all really unique things, and just that, like, you, you, there's less to sink your teeth into as a player. Mm-hmm. And my last little point on it, I'll say, too, is that I think it would be cool if... You know, that story was kind of playing out as the real life metagame was playing out. Right. So that you could, you know, as Dogmatica happened and Tri Brigade happened and then, like, you know, the next thing, like Spring Ends and all that, you were kind of finding out about them as they came out and then made an impact in the main game. And so now, mm-hmm. like, you can feel like, oh, I'm on the Spring End side or I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm Team Dogmatica. It's not, it doesn't have to be anything major, but just something to kind of invest players more into it. And it also shows, this is a new point I just thought about. We've talked about this in a video before. It also shows that Konami, like, I feel like they don't have enough faith in these things. They'd rather run back to, like, throwing Yugi and Kaiba on a product and a Dark Magician or something to just get you to care, right? Yep. Maze of Millennia. It's weird just, for a card game that started off an anime to be against the idea of making anime about their cards. Yes, yeah, I don't know. I think I'd like to see more with lore. It's just they aren't doing it. I should say, I guess, from the players in, a lot of people don't give a shit. Like, there, there is a type of player in this game I who just does not care. There are fewer of them than the amount of players who would care. Or maybe I'd even raise you this. I think that the reason people care is because Konami has not given them a reason to. Like, maybe they would care about lore if lore meant anything. If it really existed. Like, you know, if it really existed, if there were shorts or more like merch or more just things... But because whether or not you like Albaz doesn't change the fact that of like how your branded deck might perform. So like, what's it? You know. Sorry, it's like a bit of a tangent, but I just think like lore could stand to be more utilized in Yu-Gi-Oh. Hey, that's the that's that's right on target. That was your opinion about lore. Do you have a favorite lore? Um, like a favorite kind of story that's been told. Through I Yu-Gi-Oh? guess it's Albaz. Just because it's the it's kind of the most well told one, like I don't know, I can't I can't give it to anything else compared to Albaz. Just it was the easiest to follow. I like the spell book kind of endymion that whole story. Oh, what was the story? Yeah, I don't know about it, but See, it's great because good. I'm going to get to find out through so the upcoming your answer manga. Is also Albaz because that was the only story. Yeah, that's true. To follow. I mean, Albaz is the one that's probably most like followable, mm-hmm. whereas um, the spell book stuff is more like archetype related to other archetype. 
These are end the of people. story. Like, like, I don't that's know, like but yeah, I'm looking forward to at least reading about that. Mm-hmm. That could be kind of a cool thing. Okay, final question. Uh, do you think Yu-Gi-Oh should bring back special editions and deluxe editions? I don't know if you remember deluxe editions. I remember special and deluxe editions. So special editions, for those who maybe don't remember, because it's been a while since we've had them now. Special editions were those um, boxes where you it kind of looked like a starter deck or a structure deck mm-hmm. box. You'd get three copies of the most like recently released pack. They'd be a non-first edition. It cost $10, so you're getting like three packs for 10 bucks as opposed to like one pack for $4. And um, also, it would typically include a foil version of a card in the uh, next like upcoming set so you yep. get that a little early and then also like a foil version that's like a of a reprint of like just a salt after card from the last you know maybe year or so so um it's a good value proposition i remember my very first special edition that i got was raging battle the raging battle special edition in like 2010 let's say 5d's era and it reprinted allure of darkness for the first time ah. and that was a really big deal because allure was like Huge and hard to get and all that stuff. So what do you think? Should special editions come back and or deluxe editions? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Just to have more Yu-Gi-Oh products coming out that aren't just another, you know, another box set. Also, it helps us get reprints faster. Because I do miss having a first ed and unlimited copies of cards. It just felt like there were more cards going around in in general in total. Because nowadays everything's first ed. There's never a second edition. Yeah, I was gonna say too. I mean, I think it's there's they're good for a lot of reasons. They like you said, they kind of get cards recirculating mm. because Yu Gi Oh's done this thing. And by the way, they cut out special editions in like 2020. Yeah, I think it, Etco or Eternity Code was the last set that got a special edition. And so since then, what they've been doing with these products is like I think it was starting with Rise of the Duelist. The set comes out, it's first edition, that's it. Yeah, there's no unlimited edition of sets. They've done that maybe one time since they changed it for Power of the Elements kind of randomly, but like they don't. Uh, do a special edition or anything and so it's kind of like when certain sets have like a lot of staple cards like let's take Age of Overlord perhaps Age SP Little Knight um, you know Typhon what's the Horus thing you know, Wanted all that stuff M. Seti yeah if you're once your shop's kind of like sold out of its Age of Overlord it's you're quite done. difficult for shops to really order more of it like there's not like there's just kind of a limited run and I think on Konami's end I guess it's Cool. Like it's like a you know hurry get it while it's hot like Man, hurry and buy it'll be gone. But I think for players it means that in a lot of local scenes, what I notice happen oftentimes is like players get their copies of the stuff and then no more no more copies enter that kind of local circulation. Yeah, it's just done. If anyone else gets it, it's because they like ordered it off like online. In our locals, there will be no more wanted, no more Msetis. We don't have Age of Overlord. It's yeah, done. and the people who have them are just keeping them because they're using them and they, they got the bare minimum amount and like no more product really gets yep. moving there. So in that way, I do think like they really have to, uh, there's gotta be a better way for that. Yeah. Now a second benefit I think to those is that a good value to money. B, they were fun for layering the hole. C, <laughs> they, they really were, they were good value. Like back when he was like, you know, opening packs and stuff. Like if you had like X amount to spend and getting three packs for $10 is good value for money. Um, they make good tournament prize entries as well. Like if you were kind of doing like a local tournament mm-hmm. or more of like a, or maybe like a homegrown thing, like a, kind of your local library or something, they could be like a nice thing to hand out. Like for 10 bucks, you could do worse. That's true. Um, but I think Konami stopped doing it because the, the issue you run into is if you release a bad set that no one wants, mm-hmm. no one's going to want the special edition either. That is true. And, and I know that those would sit on shelves. I, I've seen the problem of like, you know, going to a Walmart or a Target. I think the last set I remember that happening a lot for was like Rising Rampage. It's Nobody like a twenty nineteen set and, and it, like people didn't really like it. It did not have great cards. Um Dark Neostorm. Like there's there's been a few sets where like if it's an underwhelming set, then the special edition will also be underwhelming and it'll sit and Konami doesn't want, you know, stuff collecting dust. So but it could stick in like good reprints in them and try and move those special edition packs. But yeah, I don't know why Konami doesn't seem to like it. I think they should come back. Um, also, to answer the question about deluxe editions, those were a bit shorter-lived. Those are those little things where you get, like, you know what? They were, like, elite trainer boxes, sort of. Were they? Because deluxe editions, you got um, nine or ten packs was what it was, wasn't it? It was, it was more. It was definitely more packs than the special like edition. Nine or ten of them. 
I don't I'm trying to remember my last deluxe edition. I want to say they were about so many thirty dollars. They're like twenty nine ninety nine, and you got like nine or ten. Packs. Why do you remember this? I have a really, really like the deep price video though. Memory. You insane. I mean, I want to say that's what it cost. It, I might, I might be wrong. I remember like getting like a lot of them for Judgment of the Light and like mm. Duelist Alliance. Judgment of the Light. That was my. That was my uh, last one. I remember mm-hmm. it now. Okay. Yeah. So. I mean, I think you probably couldn't bring them both back. You probably just bring back one or the other. Right. But um, I'm team, yes, bring them back. Yeah, I say I mean, do go it. go on Konami. I, I'll, sure. I'll buy a few. Hey, um, and, hey, and look, Konami, you just make better products, then they'll sell. I guess easier said than done. Anywho, that's going to be it for the pot of greed. That's a wrap. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. These are some pretty fun questions to sink our teeth into. I would love to get... Any other opinions on what we talked about today or just these these questions, any other stories, state of play? I hope you guys enjoy our uh, gaming Marvel AI podcast. Not too much AI today. This time. I actually have a confession. You had an AI story, didn't you? No. All the questions from the pot are AI generated. I will break it. I will <laughs> only break kidding, it. only kidding. Only kidding. So, yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you guys next week. Pass Pass turn. turn.